started. Um, first of all, I want to welcome everybody. It's good to have you here. Some uh, elected officials in the house, other than the ones that sit up here. So welcome to you as well. I'm, we'll get introduced properly in a, in a little bit. Um, and so today is a rainy, cloudy day, so there's no excuses. You don't need to be at the beaches. You need to be here or listening in. So anyway, I look forward to a really good meeting. We've got a lot going on, um, and so uh, we've got a lot to tackle today, but uh, looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to uh, start with an invocation and a pledge, and, uh, and then we'll go on from there. Please stand. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful day and for the many blessings that you have bestowed on all of us. Please watch over those of us who may be struggling in one way or another and leave us always with a sense of compassion for those in need. As we move into the summer season, please guide us to continue your work for the betterment of the residents of Pinellas County. This county is blessed with incredible employees. May they continue to do their good work for the residents with an attitude that befits you. Watch over our police and deputy officers that protect us here at home as they put their lives on the line one call at a time. Also, please give our first responders, keep our first responders safe as they go about their work of caring for us. And finally, watch over our troops that do the same around the world. They are all special people, so put your arms around each of them as they go about their duties. The Heart Agency lost one of their own this past month. Please help Thomas Dunn's work family and his own family get through this senseless and horrific tragedy. There will be difficult months ahead and years and months and years ahead for them. Please stay close to all of them. Finally, look over our residents of this county. Give them good health and safety throughout the summer months ahead. And we ask all of this in your name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay. We'll go ahead and start with the introductions here on the dais, and we'll start down there with our newest member, Townsend. Please. We're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves. Okay. I'm Townsend Terrapani. I'm from Tarpon Springs, and I'm the current vice mayor representing uh, Safety Harbor and Oldsmar here at Ford Pinellas. Sandra Bradbury, Mayor of the City of Pinellas Park. Afternoon, Ken Welch, County Commission. Darden Rice, St. Pete City Council. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commission. Whit Blanton, the Executive Director. Cookie Kennedy, representing the beach communities, Treasure Island, St. Pete Beach, Madeira Beach, Indian Shores, who are in the audience tonight. <laughs> uh, all the Reddingtons, Indian Rocks Beach, where I'm the mayor of Bel Air Beach, and Bel Air Shore. Uh, Michael Smith, Commissioner, City of Largo. Susie Sofer, uh, Commissioner of the City of Bel Air Bluffs. David Albritton, Councilman for City of Clearwater. And uh, I think we have one or two members who are not here or who are on their way, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, okay, and uh, we now move to our citizens that are here um, uh, to be heard though, for those items that uh, aren't on the agenda. Uh, please uh, come forward and uh, state your name, and you have about three minutes. Tom Nacera. I guess the only one I have is Tom Nacera. Hi, Tom. Good morning. I mean, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, uh, some updates from our vendor SkyTrain that I think you'll find of interest. One is that on um, the 10th of this month, they signed an a MOU with uh, Dubai to create a 10-mile system in Dubai. And what I found interesting about the announcement was that they are now talking about a transit system that will be able to carry 8,000 people per hour along this 10-mile stretch. I thought that was an interesting uh, and helpful statistic because for our pilot project, we're just looking at about 3,000 uh, people per hour to be able to uh, alleviate traffic congestion going out to Clearwater Beach. The other announcement that we have is that uh, Skytrain is, they've shipped them the metal and they are in the process of erecting a demo track. It'll be in San Antonio and we're expecting to get further word about this, but it looks like it could be operational by the end of next month. So for some of those that are saying, you know, it doesn't exist anywhere yet, well, they'll have something up and operational in Texas, hopefully, very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Keep us posted as things develop. Um, okay. Uh, Whit, you've got some recognitions and some announcements for your uh, with some of your employees. Uh, yes, I do. And I'm uh, excited to make a couple of announcements uh, to you all today. Uh, we have... Um, First of all, I'd like to announce that uh, we have some staff recognitions uh, that we'd like to 
uh, to note, uh, Rodney Chapman, uh, who's our division manager. Rodney, if you could stand up. They've seen you a lot, but uh, Rodney is now uh, five years uh, in his tenure with uh, Pinellas County, and we've really enjoyed Rodney's leadership. And uh, let's see, we have uh, Maria Kelly uh, in the back. Maria is the secretary of Ford Pinellas, and so much of this agency does not happen without Maria's involvement and care. So three years for Maria. <laughs> and finally, I'd direct, like to recognize Rebecca Stisley, who is our accounting services uh, coordinator, and she has been also with us for three years, and the money flows through Rebecca <laughs> uh, on the MPO side. <laughs> Uh, and she's done a great job working with the Florida Department of Transportation and our partners on all of our grants. So thank you, Maria, uh, or uh, Rebecca, for three years. That's all. <laughs> we'll be uh, recognizing each of our staff at our staff meeting tomorrow. Uh, with well, a, that's with great. And it, they, they all do such great work, and it's really nice. We get a chance to see some of the folks. We don't get to see some of them, so it's good that you get to bring them out to, to, to show them off a little bit because we're very proud of all their work. So we, thank you. Uh, I am very proud of them as well, and later on when you get to my evaluation, it's because of these things, <laughs> so keep that in mind. Uh, and then lastly, I'd like to acknowledge that we have a new staff member uh, who's here today, uh, Christina Mendoza, and Christina is uh, just joining us from the uh, private sector where she worked for Gannett Fleming in the Tampa area, and she's worked for a lot of MPOs around the around the state and uh, Christina will be joining our land use uh, side and we'll you know we're a little bit like the Tampa Bay Rays here we like uh, our staff to be uh, multi-talented to work on a lot of different things sometimes they play outfield sometimes they play first base <laughs> and Christina will be doing a lot of different things for us including uh, the work for uh, Indian Rocks Beach our visioning project that's starting next week welcome awesome. again Thank you, Witt. It's always good to get uh, uh, new talent in, in, the, in the office, and uh, good to look forward to working with you as well. Um, okay, we um, have a consent agenda. There's a few items on there. The approval of the minutes for May 8th, the approval of committee appointments at the uh, BAC, uh, B, uh, BPAC, and the uh, Technical Coordinating Committee. I noticed that we still have a, a T. Barta representative to fill at the TCC, a beach community representative for the TCC, and a St. Pete Clearwater Airport person for the TCC. So anybody out there that's listening who might be able to help us out with that, that would be great. Approval of the interlocal agreements for planning and placemaking grants for the City of Tarpon Springs and the City of Largo. <clears throat> Authorization to seek quotes for the collection of traffic counts. Approval of annual transportation disadvantaged service plan update. And the approval of scope of services for Advantage Pinellas cost feasible plan development. So. We've got those items for approval. Unless anybody wants to pull one of them, can I have a motion for approval? Move to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Did you get Stick one. that? Okay. Darden was uh, made make, made the motion, and Susie Sofer made the second. Okay. Um, nobody wants to pull anything. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Unanimously. Okay, we're on to public hearings, and first, first up is the adoption of the FY 2019-20 to 2023-24 uh, transportation improvement plan. We program. are going to. Uh, it's our it's our five year work program, and we're going to be bringing Jared Austin up to, to give that presentation. And we do have one person who wants to speak on this item. Okay. So you may want to have that person come up after Jared makes his presentation. Okay, that sounds good. Right now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Jared Hi, Austin. Good afternoon. Uh, Welcome. For Pinellas. Uh, today I'll be going over the FY 1920 through 2324 uh, Transportation Improvement Program. <clears throat> uh, so just some background. Um, Ford Pinellas is required to adopt the fiscal year uh, FY 1920 through 2324 Transportation Improvement Program by Jul July 1st, 2019 for the county to receive state and federal funding for transportation projects. Uh, just a little background about some of what's included in the Transportation Improvement Program. We do have uh, timelines, funding sources, and status of projects uh, for a variety of transportation improvement projects throughout uh, Pinellas County, <coughs> including for our 25 local governments, for uh, PSTA, uh, for our various <coughs> local airports, uh, for the Port of St. Pete. In addition to this, the Transportation Improvement Program is directly correlated with our long-range transportation plan, 
and that projects that are outlined in our long range transportation plan qualify for federal and state funding. Once that funding becomes available, they are then incorporated in the transportation improvement program. Um, hence why throughout the uh, state work program document, for instance, you will see references to the long range transportation plan. Um, so the annual TIP adoption process uh, that we're here for today involves incorporating the Florida Department of Transportation's FY 1920 through 2324 uh, final tentative work program into the transportation improvement plan. Uh, so you all received a draft or were presented on a draft of that in uh, back in November. So today we're looking to actually incorporate the final uh, tentative work program into the transportation improvement program. Um, just some supplemental materials that are included with, with this are maps of the various projects throughout the county, as well as summary tables that include project number, location, project description, and status uh, of the various projects going on throughout the county. Um, so now, again, I'll just go through uh, some of the program uh, project highlights uh, that were, again, presented to you back in November, um, and I'll just update you on anything that's changed since then. Um, so we have Alt US 19 from Curlew Place to Country Club, Club Court, adding turn lanes. Construction has been added for 2024. Uh, we have I-275 from 54th Ave South to Roosevelt Boulevard. Um, we have add lanes and reconstruct. Right-of-way has been added in 21 through 24. That was previously 22 through 24. And the design build has been added in 2024. Uh, we have Gandhi Boulevard from 4th Street to west of the Gandhi Bridge, adding lanes and reconstruction. Preliminary engineering has been deferred from 2022 to 2024. Uh, we have US 19 from 66th Ave North to 118th Ave North interchange improvements. Right-of-way has been added for 23 and 24, and construction has been moved out to 2023. Uh, we have Rosary Road from Missouri Avenue to Eagle Lake Park, complete streets improvements. Construction has been added for 2024. And we have uh, SR 590 uh, from Bayview Boulevard to Dartmouth Ave, complete streets improvements, and construction has been added in 2024. Uh, we have US 19 at Harn Boulevard, pedestrian overpass. Uh, right of way has been dropped, and construction has been advanced from 2024 to 2022. And we have Alt US 19, uh, Pinellas Ave from Oscar Hill Road to Dixie Highway, sidewalk, construction has been added in 2020. Uh, we have the Pinellas Trail Loop Phase 3, uh, construction has been added in 2024, and we have Pinellas Trail Loop Phase 4, preliminary engineering added in 2022, and the construction added in 2024. Uh, we also have the 71st, tr uh, 71st Street Trail Connector from the Pinellas Trail to 38th Ave North, uh, advanced preliminary engineering from 23 to 22, and construction added in 2024. We also have the 42nd Avenue North from 46th Street North to 35th Street North sidewalk. Uh, construction has been added in 2023. Uh, and then finally, we have the North Shore Elementary Safe Routes to School sidewalk. Preliminary engineering has been added for 2023. And we have I-275 from Alt US 19 to Gandhi Boulevard, bus on shoulder. Uh, construction added in 2020. Um, so here is just an uh, overview of some of the planned expenditures uh, compared with the revenue projections um, for the five-year period. Um, and then so <coughs> next steps, we're here today um, looking to uh, adopt the, the annual TIP. Uh, and if approved, it will then allow for the state work program to go into effect. And then briefly, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and demo to you all today something we've been working on for some time now, which is an interactive TIP. Um, so this is a new pilot project, and uh, just uh, for you all to know, we'll be sending this information out now. We have extended this and made it open to the public um, for approximately a 10-day window of time. Um, it's currently in its beta phase, um, and there is a password uh, or a username and password required to access it. Um, again, we'll be sending that out, but the username is TIP, uppercase TIP, 2019. Password is forward, lowercase, 2019. And again, we'll be sending that out, and that'll allow you to log in and see what I'm seeing currently. Um, so, Can you say that again for everybody? Yeah, yeah. So okay. the username is uppercase TIP, 2019. 
And the password is <coughs> forward, which is lowercase, Excuse me. 2019. Okay, thank you. Um, and so when you log in, you'll see just a brief overview of what the TIP is, as well as my contact information. And then you'll see a series of tabs which outline interactive versions of the ATMS ITS projects, roadway projects, bike ped projects, and then all projects on one. Um, and again, this is in the beta phase, so we don't have all projects on there currently. We will be updating um, that as well as with the new state work program projects. Um, and we're going to also be adding a few other tabs for corridor studies and that sort of thing. But just to demo a bit of what the tool does, um, you have the legend over here in your up, upper right-hand corner. And you can go and select projects, and it pulls up information such as project name, project number, responsible uh, entity. And we're also going to be adding uh, cost, project cost, uh, timelines of the project, uh, and a few other things as well. And that can be done for each one of these tabs here for the variety of projects, including the All Projects tab. And again, the legend up here indicates uh, what exact you're, exactly you're looking at on each map. Um, so with that, that was a lot of information, but I'd be happy to take any questions you have on the TIP or interactive TIP. Any questions? Um, got me? Oh, yeah, there turn. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. This is going to be very useful for the citizens out there. Um, when you talk about the cost, are you going to have the cost broken down um, between design, um, you know, all the way through construction so that they can see, instead of a big lump sum, see the breakdown of that in the tab? I think we intended to do um, just the total, but we can probably add a description for each project that outlines that a little bit more clearly. I think that would be helpful so that they're not getting sticker shock as much as right. seeing this is the cost and this is why the cost is what it is. Let me address that. At a minimum, we will have the phase that's in the work program or in the TIP that's funded. So if it's right-of-way and there's 800000 of right-of-way, you will see that. What we'll do, try to do is at least provide the overall cost of the project in addition to what phase is funded, assuming that's readily available. But I, th I think that's a good request. Yeah. You know, because there's a design phase cost right. compared to, um, you know, actual construction. So when they see that total, you know, it would be beneficial for them to see that it includes X, Y, and Z, and it's not just X that they're paying for. That makes definitely. sense. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Welch? Thank you. Um, the interactive TIP is awesome. I mean, <laughs> great idea. Do you plan to do away with the username and password at some point? Yeah, certainly. Okay. So the only reason that it's required right now, um, just to keep a long story short, essentially our Aegis um, database recently went through a migration. So some of the data that's in here currently is only accessible through their domain, which requires a username and password. Okay. But that will be going away in the next month. And did so. we build this in house? Was it a BTS project? Uh, it was built in conjunction with BTS. Okay. So, yeah. Excellent idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Count, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Mayor Fanny. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, just some clarification on the map one, uh, number nine, where it uh, talks kind of in the Tarpon Springs re region. Um, it talks about new interchange and frontage roads. Uh, can you just elaborate a little bit on that? I thought that was still a little bit in the. Its infancy phase. This was on uh, which slide? Sorry. Um, sorry, I don't have a s oh. uh, 58, maybe 59. Road projects map one. Ah. This map. Uh, it's you. Lo it, it's not there. Oh, is it not yeah. showing? It was in the backup. It's roadmap one, uh, and then number nine is where it's listed on the list, and it says uh, new interchange and frontage roads, US 19 from south of Timber Lane to uh, south of Lake Street. Not exactly sure. Sorry. Um, what is that? That's part of the interchange in overpass. No. No. Yeah, that's part. That's part of the US 19 program. That's in the. It's it's in the long range plan. Uh -huh. 
Um, so there's maybe a little bit of money that's there for design, and that's why that's there. <coughs> it, we're, we're not even to that. Okay, so it's just that, more or less a placeholder. Yeah, the whole US-19 corridor is in different phases. So we've got some that are programmed for construction, we've got some that are programmed for design, and then we've got some that are programmed for right-of-way. Um, so when you get up to the further north part, we've removed the tarpon overpass from the long-range plan, so there should be no money on that one right now. But as you go south, there is money on some of those projects in the work program. Mm -hmm. So that's probably what you're referring to. Gotcha. Thank you. And those aren't, those aren't changes uh, from what we've previ previously previewed, but you weren't on the board back in November when we had that. Thank you. Are there, uh, are there any other questions? Um, I had a question. There was a... Um, yeah, there was a, right somewhere right in there that talked about ITS improvements on Maine, Curlew, and Tampa mm -hmm. Road. Mm -hmm. What I mean, they they've already have it, obviously. So what what is what are we doing for improvements to ITS? What is going on there? Um, I would have to defer to FDOT on that one. I'm not sure. Okay. If maybe somebody if here. There's that, anyone from FDOT here. Richard, are you able to speak to that, or do we? I don't know if. <laughs> I don't think we have Ken Jacobs here today. Well, we were talking about there's three ITS improvement projects for Tampa Road, 580, and Curlew. I said that we've already got ITS there, so what would the nature of the improvements be? We will have to get with county staff and get back to you on that. Okay, sure. All right. We do have uh, we do have the advanced traffic management system deployed on all those corridors, so there may be just continued uh, maintenance and operations on those. Maybe we can get an answer from Raheem Harji. Raheem Harji, who's the <coughs> county administrator. Um, I believe those might be bringing them onto your new system as opposed to what existed out there, but what we can do is we'll go back and we'll, we'll send you the information on what those specific projects are. That way you can distribute it to the Maybe just a brief description sure. of the new system, whatever. Sure. Yeah. sure. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Now we have uh, a gentleman, uh, John Estock, who would like to uh, speak to this item. Is he, uh, oh, there he is. You could just state your name and address, please, for the record. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is John Stock, and I live at 2035 Philippi Parkway in Safety Harbor. And I wanted to talk about this FPN 4245015 that's uh, referred to as the lane continuity and express lanes north of 375. I want to start there. I think those two things, they're not the same. They're, they're not germane, um, other than they're both 275. Um, to me, lane continuity is this issue on 275 where you have to weave out of a left lane to keep going north on 275, usually because there's an exit only, a left exit only interchange. Um, that's basically as far north as 375, and it's as far south as uh, the Bayway 19 interchange. The toll lanes they're talking about are south of Gandhi to 375, so it's two different things to me. Um, I support the lane continuity. That needs to be done, but I don't support the toll lanes. I think what we do need there is a, a fourth general use lane south of Gandhi, especially at evening rush hour. You have terrible backups because the road contracts, and that's where most of the traffic is going south. Um, and then interchange improvements. Uh, basically at Gandhi um, and 118th and Roosevelt. And also, um, Keep that median clear. I would guess that the toll lanes, I don't know, but I would guess they're going to take the median. And if they take the median, to me that means there's not going to be trains. Every proposal I've seen for a train from Tampa to St. Petersburg is in the median. So uh, if you put those toll lanes there, I would say that uh, you know, there's, there's even less of a chance than there is now of ever getting a train from St. Petersburg to Tampa. On congestion pricing, um, I think gas taxes are regressive to begin with. I think congestion pricing is, is not just regressive, it's classist. It, um, it basically is going to work either when there's accidents or at rush hour. And rush hour is really um, when people go to and from work. And I don't know about y'all, but I don't get to pick and choose when I go. 
to and from work. Um, that's basically the boss, the schedule, uh, that's it. I don't have the power <clears throat> authority really to, uh, to decide that. And so I would, like I said, just the fourth general use lane, um, improve the interchanges, relieve the bottlenecks. That's what we need. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming down. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So this is a, a, a roll call, uh, a roll call vote. So do I have a motion to approve this uh, a tip uh, so program? Second. Did you get that? Go ahead and do the roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Sosa? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Council Member Rice? Aye. Commissioner Steele? Yes. Commissioner Welch? Aye. Mayor Bradbury? Aye. Vice Mayor Tarapani? Yes. Commissioner Eggers? Aye. Motion carries uh, unanimously. Thank you. Um, we're going to go down to the um, uh, an annual adoption of transportation priorities. Uh, there she comes. <clears throat> All right. Good afternoon. So now that you've adopted the TIP, uh, that will go into effect, and now we have to look at what kind of projects we would like to advance to FDOT to consider for funding as they develop the next five-year work, pro work program. Um, so just as a reminder, we annually adopt these priorities in order to move projects forward and to make sure that the priorities that we're advancing are definitely those that we uh, want to keep moving forward. Uh, we have off-the-top priorities, and we, those always come at the very top, and those are the ones that we want the department to consider for funding before anything else. And as a reminder, the projects remain on the list until completed. So you'll see in your packet, uh, there was a top section without numbers, and they all had P's next to them. Those were program priorities. And as soon as the funding is all expended and the project is complete, those come off, but we leave them at the top until then. Um, so for projects that we're removing from the priority list, uh, we have the Gateway Mid-County Master Plan. Um, that's shown as struck through on your priority list. However, in the last couple of weeks, we did get um, communication from FDOT asking them, asking us to re to leave that on the list for now because the final invoice has yet to be submitted. So that one is not actually being removed from your list. <coughs> I apologize for the slide. That information came in after this was developed. Uh, and then we have a list of funded priorities. There are about seven projects that were formerly prioritized that we're now moving to the top of the list. Jared covered all of these, uh, but US 19 from 54th Avenue South to 22nd Avenue South, that's the Complete Streets Project in South St. Petersburg uh, that has been funded for construction for the resurfacing of the corridor and a wide sidewalk. Uh, also, St. Petersburg Drive Complete Streets pri uh, priority that this board advanced for, for funding consideration last year in Oldsmar. Uh, Rosary Road in Largo, this was the other Complete Streets priority that this board prioritized uh, for funding for construction. Uh, the turn lane at Alt US 19, south of Curlew Place in the Tarpon Springs area. Uh, this was identified through our congestion management process, and this board a couple years ago did take action to set aside about a million dollars each year to fund congestion management strategies. And so the construction of a southbound turn lane was one of those, and that has since been advanced for uh, f funding for construction. Uh, we've also funded the St. Pete Downtown Analysis, and this study is really going to look at short and long-term <clears throat> transportation investments to really optimize mobility in the downtown area when considering for existing and future growth potential in that area. And the Harden Boulevard overpass at US-19 and Clearwater. Uh, and also the I-275 uh, lane continuity and express lane improvements um, from 54th Avenue South to Roosevelt Boulevard. Uh, there are also a couple sections of the Pinellas Trail Loop that were advanced for, uh, for funding. Uh, the South Gap from Bel Air up to 126th Avenue. Um, and also funded, and this was not formally on your priority list, uh, these are complete streets improvements on 1st Street North and South in downtown St. Petersburg. As uh, the FDOT has identified contact zones throughout the state of Florida, they're now prioritizing improvements to bring the streets in those areas up to those standards that, 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 they, uh, that, sorry, that they've identified um, as urban core contact zones. So the department would like to advance uh, some intersection and sidewalk improvements uh, along that corridor uh, for funding. Chelsea, could you go back the two slides? Yeah, there you go, one more. I just wanted to take a look at that. Could you describe those areas? So I, it's, I think it's hard for people to see where, where, they're, where they're taking place. So so. Bel Air Road is about up here, and this will follow US 19 down until about Haynes Bayshore. And then the trail would follow the, um, the Duke Energy Alignment coming all the way down um, through here. This is the Cross Bayou Canal over here at 126th Avenue. And the trail would follow 126th Avenue, 
down and out towards 34th Street, uh, where the PSTA uh, terminal currently is. Okay, so th that's the, that's the, the two projects, if you will. Correct. Yes. Uh, after those are done, the only remaining gap in the loop will be around the 126th Avenue over to Gandhi area for the entire Pinellas Trail loop. Thank you. You're welcome. And now we get into unfunded priorities. Oh, going the wrong way. My apologies. <clears throat> All right, so plan, uh, priorities number one and two, this is our off-the-top planning funding. Uh, for the first one, uh, we asked the department to set aside funding uh, for our own internal planning studies, like the Gateway in Area Mid-County Master Plan or the Complete Streets Grants. We really use some of our federal and state dollars to help augment staff resources to be able to complete some of these plans. The second priority is model studies. This supports the regional modeling, and uh, this board got an update on the Regional Household Travel Survey. Uh, that was going on the last few months in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, that was funded through this set aside, and we're also evaluating uh, using Bluetooth data going forward that we would use this funding for to help us with our transportation analyses. Uh, priority number three is the construction project in St. Petersburg on 22nd Street South. This is the complete streets priority that this board advanced for uh, funding consideration just a couple months ago. Number four is capital funding for PSTA bus replacements, and the line item is up to $1.5 million annually for this item. Number five is operational improvements Chelsea, along. Hold on one second. Yes. The slides back. I'm sorry, Chelsea. Yeah, you're fine. On the Vision Zero, do you have mm -hmm. a, a price, you know, of what that would cost to for funding? Vision Zero. Is there a price involved with that? I'm not certain. Two hundred. <coughs> I think it's two hundred thousand dollars that we've identified for that. Mm -hmm. All right. Priority number five is for operational improvements along the Dunedin Causeway and at the park entrance to the state park to Honeymoon Island. Priority number six is the Central Avenue bus rapid transit. Uh, number seven is the Gandy Boulevard improvements um, from 4th Street up to and including the bridges. Uh, this will include the bridge replacement, bicycle accommodation, and tra uh, trail connections along the extent of the corridor, and also planned overpasses at Brighton Bay, that's where the Derby Lane dog track is, and also at uh, San Martin Boulevard. Priority number eight is US 19 uh, corridor with the Tampa and Nebraska interchanges. Uh, the Curlew Avenue interchange is already funded for construction, and this is the next one up uh, to the north of the corridor. And this will include uh, pedestrian crossings every uh, quarter mile along the corridor as well. Uh, number nine is the transit connection between Clearwater Beach to TIA. Uh, number 10, uh, this is a new priority. Uh, this is prioritizing uh, capital investments along the US 19 corridor from 54th Avenue South up to the Gateway area. And these investments would really support enhanced transit going into the future. Uh, number 11 is the Roosevelt Boulevard connector. Um, you can see there with a the little arrow. Uh, this connects the, bay, uh, the Gateway Express down onto Roosevelt Boulevard, uh, down by uh, MLK in St. Petersburg. The car it's currently under design, and as soon as the Gateway Express is done, then it, this one's planned to go to construction. Uh, number 12 is Gandhi from 40th Street over to 16th Street. Um, this was formally identified uh, for interchanges, and this, this kind of goes hand in hand with that US 19 Gandhi Park Boulevard interchange area, um, looking at adding frontage roads along Gandhi Boulevard and other operational improvements. Uh, number 13 is that last piece of the south gap of the Pinellas Trail Loop from 126th Avenue over to Roosevelt. Number 14 is 126th Avenue North. Uh, this road already exists in certain areas, but there are gaps along it. Pinellas count, uh, County currently has a project development and engineering study uh, underway uh, to look at uh, what potential uh, improvements we could do along the corridor. Number 15 is US 19, including the Alderman intersection. Uh, we also included language on this that we wanted to evaluate the potential for at-grade options, as well as pedestrian crossings every quarter mile. And then 16 is just the next inter intersection up, which is Klosterman. Same thing with that one. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Uh, your number 17 priority is the US 19 Gandhi interchange. We're looking at operational and capacity improvements from uh, along there. Uh, that goes all the way from 66th Avenue North um, all the way up to 118th Avenue North. Uh, that pd and &E is currently uh, still underway, and um, recommendations for that will be coming to you later on this year. 
Uh, number 18 was the Alt-US-19 uh, in North County. Uh, this study is just now wrapping up to identify operational improvements that are resulting from the corridor study, so it's still more of a placeholder now until we identify what those improvements are. Uh, this allows the department to put a little funding in the outer years of the work program <coughs> so that as we identify improvements, they can quickly get funded and get implemented. Can I just say something here? Yes. And we'll be working with the department to identify the next pieces of uh, that will go into the design phase for this, so that'll be coming up. And we talked uh, last month about the uh, roundabout being advanced in the Palm Harbor area that um, could get funded for construction as part of this, but it's been advanced into design by your action last month. And that's number 19, the roundabout. Uh, we've prioritized this separately, knowing that it is coming and there is design funding. Uh, so we put that right after the corridor study with the roundabout in Alt-19 at Florida Avenue. And then number 19 is also the result of the Alt-19 corridor study. This looks at the southern extent of the corridor from Bel Air Road all the way down through St. Petersburg to Alt-19. And again, same thing for, uh, to fund the operational improvements that are coming out of that study. Uh, priority number 21 is we're looking at multi-use connections uh, along the State Road 60 corridor to link the Courtney Campbell Causeway Trail to the <coughs> D D Druid Road Trail. Uh, number 22 is sidewalks along Gulf Boulevard. Uh, this is an agenda item that you will be hearing a little bit more about later on, but this is in the Indian Shores and Indian Rocks Beach area. Uh, number 23 is a feasibility study for aerial transit uh, in the downtowns of Clearwater and St. Petersburg. Uh, 24 is an intermodal center uh, for downtown Clearwater. Uh, and 25 is a trail connection from 4th Street. Uh, when the Howard Franklin Bridge is replaced, it will include a multi-use trail along the northern side of the new structure. Uh, so we're trying to identify connections coming down 4th Street into St. Petersburg and also going out along Olmerton Road to link up with Fountain Parkway coming out of the Carillon Center. Uh, 27 is a corridor study of State Road 580, the entire extent of the corridor from Alt-19 over to Tampa Road. And then lastly is Drew Street operational improvements. Uh, we, did, uh, we did speak with the Department of Transportation and they did ask us to advance uh, the 580 quarter study and also the Drew Street study. Uh, if you recall our former Complete Streets construction grants, both of these have come up um, and the department has made the decision to kind of fund them anyways because they really like some of the concepts that were developed through our program. So just a heads up going forward, we may be reevaluating how we prioritize construction funding for um, our programs um, with the understanding that DOT may just decide to fund the projects on their corridors anyways. So there may be some adjustments to that. And just to clarify, that's for the Complete Streets grant program where yes. we offer planning dollars uh, in a competitive fashion and then we offer construction dollars in a competitive fashion. And uh, with the department um, choosing to go ahead and advance or ask us to prioritize uh, these projects for construction for what can be done. Now, this is not an ultimate remake of these roads necessarily. It may be some low-hanging fruit safety and operational improvements. Um, we are just kind of looking at, is it really effective for us to prioritize construction funding on state roads when we've got a good partner in DOT and they're looking to maybe move those ahead anyway? So we'll bring that back to you as we confer with the department and figure out what's the best strategy for us to... Mm -hmm ensure implementation of complete streets. We don't want to just fund planning studies. We want to actually get the planning work and concepts uh, on the ground. And I will point out, uh, when this went to your Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, they did make a motion. Um, the, the Courtney Campbell Causeway Trail overpass at Bayshore Boulevard was pushed out a year in the work program. It is still funded for construction, but it did move out a year. Uh, so the CAC motion was to continue to recognize the high priority of that overpass and also of improvements to the State Road 60 Belcher intersection. Um, that project is still in the project development phase, so it's not really a project yet, so it's not on your priority list, but that is one that will be coming back in the future for your consideration to prioritize for funding. So that's it for the multimodal list. I guess we can take each of these separately. If you have any questions on this list, I'd be Are happy there to any? Them. Yes. Just wanted to ask you about the Drew Street operational improvements again. Um, is that just on the county, the state, I mean, what parts of it, or are we talking about what specific uh, parts of it are we talking about on the improvements? I believe on that one, looking at the full extent of the corridor, we have had uh, meetings recently with both county and city staff to make sure we're kind of all on the same page um, as it comes to what improvements we're going to be advancing for construction, but this will look at the entire corridor. And that'll align with the complete streets plan? Correct. Gotcha. Yeah, we're, we, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago between the city and county on what the county would be willing to do, and we had a really good exchange, and 
discussion about that. Rather than just identifying this for the state only section, um, we figured we would identify the whole project in that way the state uh, can consider, you know, how to look at the transition of the road from, you know, its different context areas. Because it's a very different road when you get out towards 19 oh, yeah. versus when you get closer to downtown. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Bujalski? I just had two questions. Um, one, are they in some order on the list? Is, is the numbers a, a priority order? These numbers do represent a level of priority. Uh, what the department tries to do is go down that list in priority order and fund the projects, but recognize that, I don't know how many funding categories there are, but there are a bunch, uh, well over 100 funding categories or something like that. Um, so there may be some projects here that are better for safety funds or that are better for uh, operational funds, and the department will um, sometimes skip a project that's not ready or where there's not money in that funding category, but there's more funding in another category. So they do try to follow our party list and they've been very good about doing that. And what's the process for them to look for the funding? I mean, are they looking for funding for now or are they looking for funding for the next five years? Like, how does that work? Typically it would be in the new uh, fifth year of the work program. So we'd be looking at 2024 uh, for most of these projects, but what does happen, like we had with the roundabout, uh, sometimes when you are um, facing the end of the fiscal year, projects shift and um, uh, work gets done uh, either under budget or a project gets deferred and sometimes there is money that becomes available and so that'll find its way into our work program whenever we're able to do that. So um, it's a little bit of a dynamic process, uh, but typically it would be that new fifth year of the work program. Okay, thank you. Anything, nothing else? Got it? Got it. Okay. Anything? Yes, Commissioner. Just, I'm having a, a moment here. What does the shading on the table indicate? That is if there was a change from the prior year's priority. So you'll okay. see a lot of shading at the very bottom. We typically try to add new projects to the bottom of the list so that mm -hmm. we keep some continuity for the department to work through. Um, but like the Complete Streets projects, those are off the top, so you'll see those higher up on the list, and that's why those are shaded, because those are new projects that did end up near the top. Now, 22nd Street South, for example, is number three on the list. Yes. Is that the same rationale for that? Correct, because okay. we, we try to set aside that million dollars per year, and we want the department to consider those projects first. So okay. Complete Streets always go right by the top. All right. Thank you. You're um, I just had one question, um, and maybe it's for FDOT. Um, one of our north... Uh, one of our um, trail projects in North County is going to be looked at by the County Commission coming up later this month. I think it's later this month. Yes. Um, in any event, one of the one of the concerns that's been raised is uh, getting across 580. So there's going to be a short term or per permanent solution, but others, some of us, including myself, are concerned about it not being traversed by with a bridge. So how does something like that, if, if we decided to go forward with that project and in that fashion, mm -hmm. uh, how does that project enter into the work program? Because this is, we're talking about five years out now, mm -hmm. and that bridge, which historically we have over roads like that, we put bridges in, yes. um, had, is not planned for. So mm -hmm. how does that get considered? How well, in the last two years, and if you recall this multimodal priority list, we've only had it for a few years now. So we're still working out some kinks. Um, the Harn Boulevard overpass, that came up as a very high safety priority, and that's how that got advanced. Courtney Campbell Causeway Trail, same thing. What we're going to be doing is over the next several months, after we adopt the long range plan, we'd like to bring back to you a new process for getting projects added to the list. Uh, we'll come up with some kind of prioritization process, some kind of call for projects so local governments can submit their own priorities. And we're not just kind of taking a whole bunch and adding them onto the list every year. Um, but that's something we're going to be working with in the coming months and bring it back to you. Thank you. There are also some grant sources of fund, like Sun Trails um, funding. Okay. We've been very successful at getting Sun Trail dollars. I don't know if we'll continue at the same level, but that would that overpass could be a potentially good Sun Trail uh, okay. project because that's how the Courtney Campbell Causeway project was was covered. That overpass there. So more to come on that. But thank yeah, you. Yeah, if that's the decision of the commission, then we will work with the department to find the funding as quickly as we can. Okay. Any anything else? Okay, go ahead. All right. Well, that was it for the multimodal priority list. Uh, then we move into our transportation alternatives program. While the multimodal list is really for all sources of funding, transportation alternatives, or TA, is fairly well-defined and limited to pedestrian bicycle projects. It's a much smaller pot of money, only a few million dollars a year uh, at best, um, but it's also for infrastructure to improve non-driver access to transit. 
Now, if you recall, I came to you a couple months ago and I brought to you some proposals to overhaul our TA program. We have not done a call for projects since 2010 on this. Um, however, we do still continue to advance projects. Um, currently, Jared covered these. Uh, we did advance 71st Street North Trail Connector in St. Petersburg and then the 42nd Avenue North Sidewalk Improvements in the city of Lowman. Uh, again, we did not add any new projects to the list. These two were advanced because they were funded. And we also removed three projects because they were completed. Actually, there's four ones missing on here. Uh, 30th Avenue North um, Bicycle Facilities in St. Petersburg. Pinellas Trail Landscaping also in St. Pete. Gulfport Multi-Use Trails. And then the Druid Road uh, Trail was also recently completed, so that will be coming off the list. So that was it for our Transportation Alternatives Program. Again, more on this to come later this year as we overhaul and we do another call for projects. Any questions on that? Yes, Mayor Bradbury. Uh, the very first one that's on there for um, City of St. Petersburg, Sexton Elementary School sidewalks along 19th Street. Yes, that's a Safe Routes to School program. Yes. Yes, it has not yet been funded. Um, <laughs> I, I would like to see where the, ci the city has actually reached out to the citizens in that area. Okay. I know that road very well, <coughs> and it's extremely narrow. Yes. And there is not a lot of right-of-way available either mm -hmm. for that um, okay. project. So mm -hmm. if it is to come forward, I would like to see more details on that. Council Member Rice. We can get you that information. We haven't, uh, as a council, we haven't talked about it in some time, but I believe there was a very serious accident there a couple of years ago. And we had, uh, that's my district, uh, we had quite a few people come forward and the news stations jumped all over the um, way that cars speed through that area. Yeah, well, so that's, that part of that street is shut down every day mm -hmm. during school times. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, it, and it had come before MPO PPC <coughs> several years ago, and they, at that point in time, had not reached out to any of the citizens mm -hmm. on that street. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why I was asking to see if, you know, a, a follow-through. Okay. Yeah, we'll look into that. Anybody else? Okay. All right. One more priority list for you. Uh, the top five, <coughs> excuse me, uh, pri priorities for the TMA, that's the transportation management area. Those are the three counties made up of MPO board members from Pasco, uh, Pinellas, and Hillsborough counties. And then they had the five priorities that they advanced this year. <coughs> the State Road 6275 interchange, uh, I-75 at Overpass Road in Pasco County, I-75 at Gibsonton Road in Hillsborough County, I-275 operational improvements. This is north of downtown interchange on 275 in Hillsborough County. And then the Central Avenue bus rapid transit. They've also advanced these four trail priorities. As a region, the Duke Energy Trail in Pinellas, South Coast Greenway in Hillsborough, Bypass Canal Trail in Hillsborough, and the Orange Belt Trail in Pasco County. And as a reminder, the TMA endorses these priorities. And then these are all considered by each of the three MPOs for prioritization. So they're being brought to you uh, in whole for your consideration. And I was just talking to Witt, like apparently Hillsborough County last night mm -hmm. approved these priorities as Correct. well. There was yes. there was some concern and yeah. uh, about that, so mm -hmm. they, they did move huge. forward with that. Yeah. Yes. So good it's news. good news. Thank you. Yeah. So, so we're seeking board them. approval of all of these different priority lists. <laughs> After approval, we will transmit these to FDOT for consideration of funding uh, and the next five year work program. Okay. <laughs> and Chairman, you can take all of these as one vote or we can break these down and yeah, I think we talked votes. about them separately but I think we can bring them as one uh, does anybody have any issues with bringing all of these priorities as one uh, do I have a motion for that uh, so moved. okay uh, mayor Bajowski and Commissioner Welch a second mayor Bajowski aye council member Albritton yes commissioner Silver aye commissioner Smith yes Cookie. Yes. <laughs> That's my call. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Got to be a little yes. jokes around here once in a while. It's awful serious. <laughs> Should have been a yes. for <laughs> Yeah, I and that motion carries unanimously. She wanted me to address the citizen's comment. Oh, um, okay. On the 275 okay. project, okay. if you're okay. Yep. Uh, board members, um, I, I appreciate John Estock coming up and, and raising some concerns about the, the managed lanes uh, that are in the 275 corridor. Uh, we uh, brought that before you, I want to say last year, maybe even a little longer ago than that. Um, 
when we reached out to the department, uh, we had a letter uh, requesting that the managed lanes be extended from Gandhi South to I-375 from the city of St. Petersburg. Uh, we brought that before all of our committees. We brought that before the board. Uh, and then we prioritized it at that time. And we had a serious conversation with FDOT about that. And the rationale is that uh, the I-275 corridor is uh, one of our most heavily traveled regional corridors uh, in Tampa Bay. The travel times along that Howard Franklin Bridge in and out of St. Pete and Tampa are incredibly unreliable. Um, and I think our travelers in, our, in this region expect reliable, reliability on the bridges. And there is a concept uh, that got discussed a lot last night in Hillsborough County on induced demand. And if you just widen the road uh, without adding some, me some method of moderating that demand based on pricing, then you will, I think, overwhelm your, your interstate highway network uh, with the growth that we're having in this region. So variable price travel lanes are a strategy of moderating congestion and encouraging people to use transit in that quarter because transit will be a much cheaper alternative than driving in peak hour when it's congested if those managed lanes get built. Um, so we do have a PD&E study underway with TBARDA to look at a bus rapid transit project along that same corridor. And I see that being very complementary to the managed lanes project. We also have incredible growth in the south part of our county uh, and incredible growth to the south of us in Manatee County. And I think it's incumbent upon us in Pinellas County to ensure that our interstate corridor functions and is reliable for all users. So I get the equity uh, concern about managed toll lanes and we do have those concerns as well in this county. Uh, but if we are investing in transit in that corridor and that transit serves essentially the same corridor uh, as the managed lanes, then I think we can address that equity challenge and, and come out on the good end of that and, and feel good about what we've been able to accomplish. Um, I want to protect higher speed regional travel, and that's what the interstate's designed for. And that will enable us to do some of our complete streets projects on parallel roads like 34th Street South. So it wasn't an easy decision for us to recommend that. Um, but I do think it's the right decision. As far as rail goes, we've been advised by the Department of Transportation that if the managed lanes are built with two lanes in each direction and the lane continuity improvements, uh, that we do run the risk of having to go revisit the alignment that was chosen years ago for uh, the locally preferred alternative for rail. And I've been very transparent with the board about that. Um, frankly, if we're going to build light rail in this region, I'm not sure that I-275 elevated is the best place for a light rail line, um, especially if we are successful in getting a rapid transit option to operate in those managed lanes. Um, so we don't have money for light rail. We don't have a plan for light rail right now uh, where we can fund it. If that comes to fruition in a few years, then I think we have all the ability to work with the department, with the city, with other partners to figure out an alignment that works and makes sense if that's not still available in the I-275 corridor. Sometimes you have to take a bird in the hand versus what might be in the bush a few years down the road, and that was the thought on this. So if you all have any questions about that, I did think it was a good question for John to bring up. Uh, John is the vice chair of our Citizens Advisory Committee, and so he's been very good about weighing in on this issue at a lot of our meetings, and we appreciate that. Thanks, John. Um, yes. Yeah. Different subject. I just wanted to uh, thank Witt and his staff for working with the city of Dunedin in regards to the Honeyman Island entrance and getting it on our mm -hmm. priority list. Um, anybody that's ever visited Honeymoon Island um, during peak times understands that the traffic is backed up on Curlew all the way to County Road 1. And um, uh, I understand that design the Parks Department already has, in the state already has the money for design. It's a matter of actually just building <coughs> in it. And it's only, from what I'm told, around a $500,000 project, which is relatively small compared to some of the projects that we do, and could have a huge <coughs> impact on that area um, if completed. So I, I thank you for working towards that. And I would urge FDOT to see, you know, when they, as they have money, um, to consider that because it's a highly impactful congestion reduction, which of mm -hmm. course is one of our top three goals here at Forward Pinellas. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those who may not have seen it, we do have a letter from um, Eric Draper, who's with the is the head of the Division of State Parks. That was in the packet, right? Uh, it was not, but we will get that to everybody. 
So there was a response basically acknowledging the request and acknowledging that, that uh, the parks, uh, the DEP does not have money for that right now. Okay, anything else? All right, we're gonna move into some of our presentations. First up, PSTA activities. Council Member Rice is gonna give us that report, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, starting off first, our, our PSTA board met on May 29th, 2019, and starting with passenger and operator safety. As the Chair mentioned in the invocation today, um, a heart operator was fatally assaulted while driving a bus in Tampa on May 11th. And um, at PSTA, um, safety and comfort of our passengers and our employees is the number one priority. And board members and our staff to a person take this incident very seriously. We heard from a number of our PSTA and heart bus operators at our last board meeting uh, about their concerns and about their needs. So PSTA has already trialed a barrier on our buses since October of last year, but we have not come to an agreement with our operators about uh, the use of these barriers. But since our board meeting, uh, PSTA management held a meeting to discuss options for operator barriers with the PSTA and HART unions in collaboration with HART management. So at the upcoming PSTA Finance Committee meeting, staff will, will present a procurement plan for our new operator bus barriers, including how to achieve the full fleet coverage um, as quickly as possible. So previously we had been looking at the barrier coverage for a smaller amount of bus, buses, but this, unfor this unfortunate incident has compelled us to look at speeding that up and putting it on all of our buses. So um, next update is Central Avenue Rapid Transit. Um, the Central Avenue corridor is the highest transit ridership corridor in our region, and we are working hard to advance rapid transit service for this very important connection between downtown St. Pete and the beaches. Um, there have been many conversations over the last few weeks with the city of St. Pete Beach, and including the most recent presentation that PSTA uh, delivered last night. Uh, PSTA is still working with the county to uh, make our beach, the beach access parking lot, a viable end of line station that is located at the county beach access across from Dolphin Village uh, on Gulf Boulevard. And uh, perhaps when I wrap up with this report, what if you could weigh in? Um, and. Board Member Alberton, uh, you were both there at the meeting last night to give us an update on how that went. Um, the City of St. Petersburg will be voting at our council meeting tomorrow night um, based on public comments that have been made over the last several <coughs> weeks and months. Um, I anticipate uh, wholeheartedly that City Council will approve an interlocal agreement to participate in the local funding with the city's contribution of $4 million to the project. Um, as we get closer to 60% design completion, we will hold public open houses along the corridor and further engage the public on the project. These are tentatively scheduled from uh, sometime in mid to late August. Additionally, PSTA released an RFP for transit-oriented development planning in the corridor as supported by a grant from the FTA. That will also feed into the City of St. Pete's Vision 2050 uh, um, planning process. Um, this type of community investment and corridor planning wouldn't be possible without the BRT project, and PSTA is pleased with both the City of St. Pete and um, our agency, Forward Pinellas, and very pleased that we've agreed to take on uh, an extremely active role in the project. Uh, on the budget, we're dealing with some funding shortfalls and needs. As PSTA close in on, closes in on the draft budget for the year 2020, uh, we continue to demonstrate our efficiency, but there's also, it must be noted, a general lack of investment in public transportation in our county. Uh, we're very much looking forward to the County Commission funding workshop to be held on July 18th to discuss all unfunded transportation needs throughout the county, and that's transportation and transit. 
Uh, we expect a productive conversation about the entire transportation system and how we might move forward to fund these needs. Um, our next regular board meeting will be held June 26th uh, at 9 a.m. And without any further questions, I move to receive and file the PSTA report. Thank you. Appreciate it. No. Okay. We don't, but does anybody have any questions for Council Member Rice? Okay. And I think uh, Commissioner Seal is going to give us a Tabarda report. Correct. Um, our last board meeting was on. Excuse me, did you have a question? I thought you were going to weigh in on the meeting in St. Pete Beach last night. Oh, did you yeah. want to? I can do it now if you would like okay. to, or I can That's do it later. Sorry. You can do that now. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Excuse me, Commissioner. That's okay, Commissioner Seal? Okay. So, yeah, I, I attended the meeting last night. Um, Whitney Fox of PSTA, so we were the Whit and Whitney team, maybe. <laughs> she did a great job. I thought she gave a very compelling presentation that spoke from the perspective of uh, the people who use the Central Avenue trolley today, um, and she put it in human terms and did a great job. Um, I felt compelled to, to go up and speak a little bit because there was some confusion about the data that we provided to PSTA. Um, the, the fact is that 80% um, of the workforce in St. Pete Beach lives somewhere else. Um, and 40% of that workforce, half of the workforce comes from St. Petersburg, principally traveling along the Central Avenue corridor on the First Avenues uh, or on 22nd Avenue South. Um, the the issue, I think, is that over decades, St. Pete Beach has developed a wonderful beachfront community that is a primary tourist destination and has had over 3 million tourists in the last year <coughs> in that community. Uh, they've built a community that people want to live in, that people want to go to, and people want to enjoy their, their restaurants and hotels and all that. And St. Pete <coughs> is growing incredibly fast, and the Central Avenue corridor is one of our major growth corridors in, in Pinellas County. So I think it's incumbent on us to, to figure out what's the best transportation solution. And we know we're not widening roads in that part of the county. We're not widening Gulf Boulevard. We're not widening really that many roads in our whole county. So we are stewards of the future, and we do have to look 10, 15, 20 years ahead of how we want our community to grow and how we want to travel. So I made that point that the data that we are looking at is from the U.S. Census. Uh, it's not made-up data. It's accurate data. There was some confusion about where that came from. And then uh, the city was discussing their, rec their preference would be to have the transit vehicle stop at 75th <coughs> and Gulf Boulevard, which is where Cory Avenue is, sort of their downtown, where they've been trying to do redevelopment for about 12 to 15 years and generally have been stymied in a lot of those efforts. And I, I made the point that if we don't go down to the county park, then we really run the risk of undermining a, a major investment in a good transit project uh, because you've got to go past those hotels. You've got to serve the, the needs of the people who work in those hotels and, and depend on transit. And if you just go to 75th, there's just not that much there. Um, and the city has promised uh, to develop their own local transit system that would connect people further south. And uh, I don't think we should put a $40 million project up to those kinds of vague promises. I think we need to find a terminus that works for the project that doesn't require people to transfer another time uh, because when you start introducing two and three transfers with transit, you really kill the effectiveness of transit. And I made those points last night. Um, they were some questions about whether the people who presented from PSTA could make commitments uh, on behalf of PSTA and the board, and they can't uh, because the board has not taken up whether 75th and Gulf or the county park is the exact location. Those discussions are still underway with the county. Um, but I stepped forward and said, as the executive director of Ford Pinellas, I can commit that I will strongly advocate for the county park location, and that would be my recommendation. And that is a compromise solution already. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the, the bus length goes, I think they're in agreement that smaller buses will run in that corridor, and that is a concession to the city of St. Pete Beach. Um, I'm, I feel like that um, we really do need to respect the character of all of our communities and their desires. But there does come a time when we've got a viable project that um, works for a large percentage of our county and serves a real need in our county, and we need to keep the big picture in mind. And this is in the top five of the regional priorities as endorsed by the TMA. It is extremely high on our priority list. It's one of our top priorities of after the set-aside. And I just think we've kind of laid this out really since the 1960s in terms of our development pattern that this is a corridor. And the last 10 years of growth have really reinforced that we're, we're ready to look at this kind of an investment. And if we don't start with Central Avenue in a very productive corridor where we have excess 
capacity on the roadway network to accommodate a transit investment, I don't know where else we begin in Pinellas County. And to me, this is the first step of a, of a much more robust and a much more effective and efficient transit system that the people in this room can envision using. And I think that's important too. So I made those points last night, and uh, I'm not sure the city of St. Pete appre Beach appreciated them, <clears throat> but I think it needed to be said, and I'm not gonna back away from those comments. I think getting them bought, getting getting by those hotels is critical. And I think, is, is it the county park where we're envisioning a physical turnaround? Is that is that where we're talking about? Correct, so not the beach only, access. Right, yeah. So we not, so not only do we get by the hotels, but at least we have a place to turn around. And, right. and, safely. And, and, yeah, safely and turn, thank you, <laughs> and turn back the other way, so. And, um, and you know, we want St. Pete Beach to be a great partner, and we want to be a great partner to them, and we're committed to doing that. Um, you know, one, one thing does not affect other things. Um, but I do think that we are, in, we are in a really small county. We're very compact. We're a million people. We're going to add another 95,000 people by the year 2045. And we got to figure out a way to get them around. And I do think transit has a role in doing that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other comments or questions on that? I do have a yes. comment. I don't know if you're going to Councilmember Albritton or not. You did mentioned you have, that earlier. Did, I don't want to Do you have a ahead. comment, Council? Well, yeah, I could reflect on I, being on the PSJ board. I wanted to actually go down and hear for myself what was going on because I heard so many times that PSJ had gone to those meetings and either they were arguments or not being heard or. But I tell you, last night, uh, Witt was right on on his presentation, very eloquent, very, answered everybody very professionally. PSTA reps were very good at what they did. It couldn't have been better because it was, it was, you could tell two things I took away from it. They don't want buses on St. Pete Beach. And um, they don't, I don't think, understand that this is the beginning of a bigger picture project that mm -hmm. will go all the way up to Pasco. I mean, you know, it's all connected and nothing but beneficial to them. So I'm hoping we can <clears throat> carry on negotiations and get them to understand it's real important not to, uh, just stop at 75th. Commissioner Welch. So, so I, I just would echo Councilmember Albritton's um, comments. I watched it on, watched the replay last night, and uh, a lot of it was flashback um, <laughs> to some earlier, and some of the same folks um, who opposed uh, some earlier projects. I guess I, I just want to commend PSTA and WIT. Um, Saw a little fire and passion from you when you got up there. <laughs> um, I think y'all have done everything to try to compromise. That word was used several times. Uh, you removed the St. Pete Beach investment from the agreement. Mm -hmm. You've um, cut the route basically in half. It was supposed to go to the Don Cesar. You've mm -hmm. cut that back down to the beach access. Um, and so I guess and you've also shortened the buses as well. <coughs> I guess my question, and in, in, just kind of reading what the commission and the mayor were saying, it, it, they were pretty much set on 75th as being the terminus. So uh, hopefully y'all can move them to the St. Pete Beach access point. But if they stick to 75th, my question is, is it still viable in terms of ridership? There were two other alternatives. Um, and how does that impact federal funding in that process? They even asked last night for a pause in the project. So uh, I'm just, where does PSTA go if they stick to the 75th Avenue? Well, I think Cassandra may be in a better position to answer this than me, but I will say that, you know, the, the, the point I tried to make was, you know, this is a state road. We're not restricting trucks on a state road. Uh, there are still public trucks making deliveries to the publics. Um, so that's not a whole lot different than the buses. Um, that, that's a heavy ridership segment that's projected for the ridership uh, in, in the plan. So I think you run the risk of making it a weaker project in the competitive federal process, which is highly competitive. And we looked at Treasure Island and we looked at, looked at Madeira Beach. Um, you have some of the same issues with opposition to redevelopment in Madeira Beach. Uh, and Treasure Island has the same restrictions on redevelopment. I think it's a referendum uh, requirement that they would have to do for any redevelopment. So St. Pete Beach already has the density of development, um, and we don't need redevelopment to make the project successful in St. Pete Beach. I think you'd go back to Madeira and you'd go back to Treasure Island and you would say, 
now go show us how you're redeveloping this area to receive this investment. And I don't think we have to say that for St. Pete Beach, but I'll let Cassandra address that um, more directly from PSTA's perspective. Good afternoon, Cassandra Borchers, Chief Development Officer at PSTA. Um, looking at the other alternatives <clears throat> that we explored during the alternatives analysis phase would set us back, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in terms of time. Um, we are going to rerun our travel demand model um, based on the changes that we've made to the project so far, and we believe that we'll get actually higher ridership now because we have seen a growth in ridership along the Central Avenue corridor. And so we do still think that this is a viable project. Um, as Whit mentioned, we are looking at the beach access point and believe that that will be the terminus of this project. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, obviously these hotels out there are, are critical um, destinations uh, or attractive destinations for our tourists, big time. Mm -hmm. Our workers, a lot of workers, I mean, and all workers should be protected as much as possible with as few transfers, regardless uh, whether you're going to work or whatever you're doing. We should always consider less stops or less transfers as a better thing, either for the tourists going to St. Pete or further up the beach, or the workers coming to work. And I think in the end, we're looking at, I mean, St. Pete Beach is all in on tourism. It's not like it, they're only got one toe in the water. So this is a huge commitment by a lot of folks, not for their behalf, for the people that use or go to St. Pete Beach for whatever purpose, it is a big investment on their behalf. And they may not like it, they may not want it for some short short term reason but in the end i think this is going to be really really good for um for folks that come visit our area or for folks that are trying to get to work for crying out loud so anyway um we'll move on to um commissioner seal for her report on tibarda thank you very short report uh, we have approved um, at our last meeting on may 17th travel and expense reimbursement policy and guidelines uh, we adopted uh, the resolution for the MPO regional coordination structure and best practices for the Tampa Bay regions, their final report. Uh, legislative update, uh, T-BART have received a $2.5 million appropriation and $1.5 million is for operating expenses and more excitingly, perhaps, uh, $1 million is to do innovative transit option studies. And so um, these are non-reoccurring funds for now. So one time we go back every year to see if we continue to keep our doors open, I guess. Next meeting is scheduled for June 21st, and that is all. Any questions for Commissioner Seal? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to take just a slight detour. I asked um, our secretary who's here today to come forward and maybe just give us a little perspective on the activities that happened in uh, Tallahassee this year as it relates to commitment to transportation projects in general. So, secretary. Sure, thank welcome. you. And um, I'll, I'll mention you had talked about the vote in Hillsborough County last night. It actually happened this morning. We, uh, we went well into the morning this morning as uh, it was a, a rather uh, robust meeting had a lot of um, passionate people on both sides of, of the issue and at the end although there was a vote to approve the the tip which includes the operational improvements which in addition to providing some regional um, interstate capacity improvements also allows for the continued progression of the regional bus rapid transit or re regional premium transit um, project there still was a 10 to 6 vote, and six of the members, including the Hillsborough members of the TMA, were uh, in opposition to it. Uh, my concern, my only concern going forward is that um, there was a continued, um, I guess, promise to continue to fight this in the future. And so we're going to have to continue as a region to try to protect those regional facilities. And of course, DOT is a regional um, provider. And so I think it's not going to go away, but the good news is, is we are still being allowed to go um, forward. But I think it's going to be something that continues. Uh, unfortunately, I think there is a, a portion of the MPO in Hillsborough County who really believes that any investment in highway, especially interstate improvements, is contrary to promoting transit. Uh, we're trying to espouse more of a 
we can do both type of an approach and we'll continue to do that but so uh, I think we're going to continue to to work through this and the TMA will play a big role in that um, as well as the folks in Pinellas and Pasco County as well as far as the uh, state budget um, and and our budget um, from what I heard as of yesterday the, the governor still has not been presented the budget so we still have to wait to see what his uh, any vetoes or, or changes he would make but uh, from what we've heard, we don't expect to see any big changes from him to our budget. So we were able to get pretty much what we had asked for, which is about a $10.8 billion budget, of which almost $10 billion of that is work product or uh, things that are outside of just funding our general operations. So that's very good. Um, we uh, did receive good, good funding for the district. The one thing that was, um, I guess, added in that we had not asked for, but that was uh, brought up during the session was the uh, multi-use corridor bill, which uh, Senator Galvano had uh, brought forward, <coughs> which um, allows us, or I guess tasks us with um, studying three new corridors. Um, they would be toll facilities throughout Florida. One would be from Southwest Florida in the kind of the Naples area up into uh, the Polk County Parkway area. One would be from the uh, northern terminus of the Sun Coast up towards Interstate 10 and perhaps up to Georgia. And the third would be extending the Florida's Turnpike westward out to some place along this new extension of the Sun Coast. The important, two things were kind of important about that. The one is um, they are required to have a feasibility study done that will determine whether they can even be built. And so it's not I guess a mandate to build these facilities, a mandate to do studies. By um, August 1st, we have to have task forces in place, which include all stakeholders that you can imagine, including a lot of folks from the environmental community, as well as from the local governments and different areas along each of these routes. Um, and so over the next year to 14 months, we'll be doing those feasibility studies to determine if any of these are feasible to go forward. Um, the good news on that um, also is that if you remember back about maybe eight or so years ago, um, a good portion of the tax and title registration uh, fees were taken from the department and put back into the general revenue, about $135 million a year. So that money is being redirected back into the Transportation Trust Fund, and a portion of that money is what's going to be used to start to fund the, these mobility corridor studies as well as any projects. And there's also money in there, two other things that I think are really important. There is more money for um, county incentive grant programs and other programs. Some of it is more geared towards rural counties, but there's still uh, more money for transportation there. And there's also recurring funding in there for a continuation of workforce development funds to try to provide more opportunities for people to be able to, to get into the construction industry. And so overall, I think it was a very good session. We're happy with, with what we were able to get. And assuming, assuming there's no major vetoes, um, I think we're good, good to go for the next year. Great. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I just wanted to get some perspective that I think transportation is, is holding good. We are. Out there. And I think that's what we're all looking for, a continued commitment to that and maybe even squeeze a few extra dollars yeah. for our infrastructure. So thank you. All right. Appreciate thank you. you being here again. All right. Okay, we're going to do another little detour. Um, you know, it's always about detours. We're going to go down to item D, which is the Gulf Boulevard drainage sidewalk project, and bring that up to consider next. And um, Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is, uh, for those of you who don't know me, Pat Serrano, uh, Mayor of Indian Shores. Uh, I want to thank the board uh, for taking in, uh, the time to hear our, our concerns with respect to pedestrian and bicycle safety on Gulf Boulevard. Uh, our chief of police is handing out a booklet. We don't have an electronic presentation, uh, but uh, this book you can take home and read at your leisure. Uh, and it uh, pretty much covers, uh, covers the territory. Uh, before I, I, I get into the, the actual presentation, uh, there is something I, I do want to say. and. and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say it. Um, I'm a relative novice to the political arena. And uh, uh, Executive Director uh, Whit Blanton and uh, the District Secretary Gwen have been invaluable to us 
in supporting us, helping us navigate this process, and getting to this point, uh, the, the original drainage project was on, was on schedule, and uh, as we began to look at Gulf Boulevard and the issues there, we realized that there were more issues than just uh, drainage. And so it is the 11th hour, and um, uh, what they have done has been remarkable. That's the only way I can describe it. Um, we're here to talk about pedestrian and bicycle safety, but before I begin, I'd like to introduce my cheering section, which is, uh, I have some council and electeds with me. Uh, Vice Mayor, Diantha Shear, uh, Mike Petricelli, Councilor, Bill Smith, Councilor, uh, Chief of Police, Rick Swan, and Bonnie Deneau, who's also been one of my chief navigators in helping us get through this process. And you're going to hear from Chief, uh, chief Swan from the uh, from the legal aspects or police aspects of uh, what we're trying to do here. We met with two other boards. Uh, we met with uh, uh, Bicycle Safety and Pedestrian Safety Board, and we met with the technical, I guess, technical committee. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I told them at that time, I said, there's a couple things that keep me up at night. One is hurricanes, and my wife and I have had some real interesting experiences with hurricanes, and pedestrian safety on Gulf Boulevard. And I'm up and down Gulf Boulevard all the time. And every single day, I see a situation that has the potential to turn into a catastrophe. Thank God it hasn't happened, although we've had some serious situations, and, and uh, the chief will talk about them uh, shortly. The other one, add a little levity, levity to it, is, you know, my wife and credit cards. And uh, Mayor Cookie knows my wife, so she can probably appreciate exactly what that's all about. Uh, the reason we're here today is to um, request a priority status for uh, drainage and uh, sidewalks for approximately two miles of uh, Gulf Boulevard. Uh, this project has been ongoing since 1997. And if you would open your book to the first page, I have a, an abbreviated timeline. Um, and I would tell you that uh, we could probably fill several file cabinets <laughs> full of information, emails, plans, agendas uh, with respect to this project that dates back to 1997. Mayor, if you want to put that over the seal of Pennsylvania County, what? we can get the that seal. up on the TV. The seal right there. The put seal. It right, yeah, there's the... Put it. It's, you're sitting right on... The book is on top of it right now. Nope. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, bring it down. Is that We'll bring it down to the seal in front of you. you. Put it on the seal. Then put it's it on, on the, the overhead. Yeah. Yeah. And then just shift it over. Okay. Here. Shift it a little bit to your left. This is like sounds like a I test. I know. <laughs> uh, I Sorry. Okay. If you can, ju yeah, shift it. We got it right over. now. Get yeah. a little more. A little more. A little more left. Keep going. Left, okay. Left, left. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I don't want to lose yeah. anything here. Yeah. You're okay. Good. All right. Anyway, as you can see, and th uh, uh, this is an abbreviated version. Uh, literally, the the the, the, uh, the uh, unabridged version is about a cabinet full of information. But anyway, all I want to point out to you is the project was recognized back in 1997 as a need to have sidewalks and drainage on Gulf Boulevard. And as you, as you proceed along the timeline and you get to 2005, at that point, Indian Insurers took on, by itself, the undergrounding project and paid for it out of general, general revenue funds for the town. Uh, and eventually secured a loan for it. And that was to be in conjunction with uh, the drainage and sidewalk project. Well, what happened was 2007. 2007 was the recession, the Great Recession as some call it. And at that point, uh, the project was killed and we got something that's called pervious uh, asphalt, which does not work in a sandy environment. And I guess it was the best we could do at the time because of financial constraints. Uh, going forward from that point, um, you can see where basically we're at uh, June of 2019, which is where we are today. Um, we have some obviously serious concerns uh, about uh, safety. And what I'd like to do is basically get our chief of police up here, Rick Swan, and uh, basically take you through, since we don't have an electronic presentation, 
take you through some of the pictures and let him explain to you some of the implications from a law enforcement perspective. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Richard Scott. I go by Rick. I'm the chief of police in Indian Shores. I'm also a resident in Indian Shores, so I'm quite familiar with the problems uh, on a personal basis as well as a professional basis. Uh, the reference I've heard at, at all three of the meetings that we attended was uh, regarding the pervious uh, asphalt was put in place to provide drainage. Uh, I refer to it as the impervious pervious drainage because uh, the streets flood at the least amount of rain. In fact, some of the most recent um, improvements that have been made with landscaping and uh, sprinkler system are now flooding up and down Gulf Coast. It is not limited to Indian Shores as a whole, but obviously that's that's what we're here to talk about it. But it actually runs from Walsingham to Park Boulevard. Uh, yesterday's rain uh, flooded several of the uh, main uh, cross sections in front of the hotels. The the two mile lane that we're talking about in particular is a two lane highway with limited bike path and pedestrian path. As you see here, we use our signboard on a regular basis to tell people they can't pass on the right-hand lanes because of pedestrian safety. Um, I can tell you that we are currently working an accident that occurred, a uh, pedestrian accident that occurred uh, last week where another citizen was struck. Where, uh, Chief, could you turn your hub? Which the other, Yeah, just rotate it. Yeah, you got it. Just so folks can see it straight up. Okay. Thank you. I thought maybe you were going to keep telling the mayor no, to keep going. No, 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 that's far <laughs> enough to the left anyway. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, we also use the signboard in front of City Hall to, as a reminder uh, that the bike path and the, and the pedestrian path, while they provide a certain amount of safety, they are still very uh, small lanes, and we have continued problems with vehicles parking in the lanes driving in the lanes, and, and unfortunately, we, it results in um, pedestrian injuries. If you look at some of this, uh, it will show you as, as vehicles cross out of the, the lanes, out of the driveways, uh, th these pictures represent, represent just some of the amount of foot traffic that's in these lanes and the amount of uh, danger that's presented. And this is during the daytime hours. As you move through these pictures, you can see tourists are not always the most practical. They load <laughs> lawn chairs. Uh, I, 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 we saw somebody walk about two miles today with lawn chairs and, and a cart to get to the beach. They were coming over the Park Street Bridge and down these two aisles. So it's quite, uh, quite interesting to watch at times. But the next picture, if, you, if it is on the board, will show you some of the flooding. This is a minimal uh, uh, picture of flooding that occurs up and down Gulf Boulevard. What occurs uh, more often than not is people will not use these lanes, including the bicyclists and the pedestrians, will deviate from the designated bike paths and the, and the walking paths and walk out into the road because they don't want to walk through the puddling. Unfortunately, as the rain occurred yesterday, sometimes this puddling gets across the entire uh, uh, sp span of Gulf Boulevard and will be a foot, uh, anywhere between eight inches to a foot deep. Uh, you have pedestrians trying to walk across these, uh, these intersections or to, to visit some of the businesses in there. They're walking their dogs. They take their dogs, their children, small children, out into the walkway. Uh, even though we have uh, designated walk paths where they're supposed to push the button and walk across. Oftentimes, unfortunately, the way the drainage problem has uh, increased, this is becoming even more hazardous because they're not using the cross paths anymore because those are flooded out. Uh, we have several more representations of that, but I can tell you from a safety perspective, when we met with the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee, they agreed with us. Uh, we made some recommendations. I think they were, they were accepted, um, and, and we're very happy with those uh, suggestions that they made. But as the mayor said, um, pardon me, this is definitely a, a priority to us. It is a big safety concern. Um, this is an area that does not have a lot of right-of-way. We have limited options, but the options that we've, we've uh, 
proposed and have been accepted by the by the advisory committees are uh, are very good for us, and we would ask that you you consider uh, making us a top priority as as this project moves forward. Thank you. Any, any questions for the chief, mayor? Yeah, go ahead, Councilmember Rice. This could be a question for anybody, but um. What specifically is contributing to the flooding in this particular area? Like, why is it bad here and not along other parts of the road? Unfortunately, in part because of the, or primarily, I guess, <clears throat> uh, the pervious asphalt is not designed for beach uh, areas. The sand penetrates through, as I understand, I'm not an engineer, but as I understand it, because I've asked the same question, and it gets worse, and it's gotten progressively worse. I've lived in, in my, my home for the last two years, and I can tell you on a personal basis, uh, it's gotten progressively worse uh, to the point where this past summer, uh, it actually intruded all the way into the driveway and into the garage. So it is, you know, it is getting worse. The sand permeates through and uh, actually becomes clogged. It, you know, it tightens up and it becomes clogged and therefore there's no drainage. The roads are not designed where the, the runoff has any other outlet to go out. Uh, and uh, so it just builds up in the road until it basically dissipates. And this uh, previous pavement is not for the length of Gulf Boulevard, so it's really concentrated in the Indian Rocks Beach, Indian Shores area. It goes south to about Park Boulevard. And again, it, it, we're speaking primarily for our community, but... Um, I would tell you that Indian Rocks Beach is is, uh, is suffering from the same issues. So, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Yeah, just a couple of couple of uh, mention a couple of other things. Um, uh, since I'm up and down Gulf Boulevard most of the day, uh, hold on, I'll take my stuff. Uh, I, I I mentioned this to the both committees uh, that we spoke to prior. Um, you have to kind of uh, envision, and you've seen some of the pictures, so you kind of get the sense. But think five or six family members walking on Gulf Boulevard. They're not facing traffic. They're three abreast. For some reason, they think it's safe because this is a pedestrian and bicycle lane. They're not paying attention. That outermost person uh, on the left side, they put their elbow out. In a lot of cases, they could be hit by the side view mirror of that car passing. Now. That's bad enough, but think about this at night when the visibility is, or if there's a, a fog or whatever, uh, the, the chances of a tragedy are increased dramatically. Uh, I don't think we're overstating this when we tell you as a board that uh, since 1997, this has been on, you know, on the docket, so to speak, and we're finally getting to the point where I think, and I, I can tell you, our council... We don't agree on everything, but this is one thing we agree on, that we absolutely need to enhance pedestrian safety on Gulf Boulevard, and the only way we can see that being done is with sidewalks. So, just a couple of last comments. Um, I know there are competing priorities. I heard them. <laughs> um, but in, I've been a, a senior executive, and I've been a management consultant in my day. And I know there are things that are nice to have, and I know there are things that you must have. I implore you that this is a must have. This is not a nice have. This is a must have. Um, some projects require studies. <coughs> some projects you don't need studies. They represent a clear and present danger, this, this situation that we have on Gulf Boulevard. We don't need to do a study. We know that we have a problem here, and it's a serious problem. And we implore you to work with us to get what we need to, to basically ensure the citizens of Indian Shores are safe. But it's not just Indian Shores, because a lot of you, your folks from your respective city come to the beaches. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox, and I'll thank the board for your time. And uh, any questions, further questions? Uh, yeah, Mayor Brad, uh, uh, Bradbury. Uh, yes, with the two stripings for the bicyclists and the pedestrians, um, and the pictures you showed, I did not notice that you guys actually have those designated with the painted bicycle person, you know, the painted yeah. they are walking they area. They are more. Uh, not a double lane. There's not two white. And I'll let uh, 
you know, we talked a little bit about this. We, we do have a presentation from DOT coming up right now, yeah. so maybe that will no. clarify yeah. some of the technical questions that you may have about what's okay. there and what's yeah, not. Yeah, because I was seeing the double stripes here, yeah. so that I was assuming one of them was yeah. for bicycle and one was for pedestrian. Yeah, right? so, yeah thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. And, uh, when Chief, I drive thank down you. the and narrow beach communities, I'm not looking at yeah. the road. I'm looking at the cars mm -hmm. in front of they these. Very, yeah, uh, uh, if you're going to speak uh, more, come up here, please. I, I really want to capture your... In, in response to your question, they are more, but they're very narrow. Mm -hmm. And and again, if, if there's multiple citizens, the oh. carts, the chairs, all the other things, <coughs> that was the, the, the reason for showing those pictures, oftentimes they move into the lane. So we have a double problem. There's no <coughs> barrier that prevents them from going into the lane, and there's no barrier that prevents people from driving out. Uh, adjacent to our community, there are several rental places that rent carts, um, scooters. Mm -hmm. Some of our local communities uh, uh, allow golf carts. If they're street legal, we can't really prevent them, but oftentimes they don't travel the speed limit. So they'll pull over into the bicycle and pedestrian lanes. We're constantly having to run them out of those lanes because they pull over because they back up the traffic. So uh, with the construction that is currently underway with the underground cabling that's running through there, and the proposed uh, ongoing construction. Uh, we're getting additional delays, we're getting frustration, we're seeing a little bit more ro road rage, and I think that's why we're seeing an increase in pedestrian versus vehicle accidents. We're, we're working at least once, one to two, every three or four weeks now. And when so. I noticed the very last uh, slide that you have here, there's a delivery truck parked yes. on where it shouldn't be. And that is also one of the problems that we discussed in the in the planning meetings, uh, the barriers that we proposed and we agreed to and, and we recommend would help us prevent that as well. We are constantly having uh, the delivery trucks uh, have to get out of the lanes as well. So. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Come on up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Henry. I'm the District Bicycle Pedestrian Coordinator for FDT District 7. I also have Jennifer Musselman with Kittleston Associates. And uh, this afternoon we're going to be talking about what the department is doing both in the near term as part of the ongoing drainage project that the mayor mentioned. Um, to address some of the concerns regarding pedestrian safety and drainage along the corridor, uh, and then also presenting some concepts that we developed of what um, a longer-term future project uh, to uh, fill in the sidewalk gap might look like along Gulf Boulevard. So, as the mayor mentioned, um, currently there is a sidewalk gap along Gulf Boulevard uh, from Park Street north to Walsingham Road. Um, this uh, gap spans both the city boundaries of Indian Shores and Indian Rocks Beach. And if you'll notice, um, the right of way along the corridor varies depending on where you are along the corridor. Um, for some sections of the roadway, you have up to 50 to 60 feet of right of way, um, where there's a little more opportunity to, to fit some things in. But a, a large portion of the corridor uh, without sidewalk is within a 40 foot constrained section, which really kind of limits what we are able to do. Um, existing typical sections, so this is what it looks like out there today. Um, this is in that 50 to 60 foot wider section. Um, basically, you have 10 foot travel lanes in each direction, a, a five foot uh, bicycle lane um, on the west side. You have a five foot shoulder, which is marked for pedestrian use. Um, and on the east side, it varies. Um, in some spots, you have parking. In some spots, there's actually a little right away an existing sidewalk. Um, it kind of varies depending on where you are along the corridor. Um, the majority of the corridor and what we'll be focused on mostly today uh, is within that 40 foot uh, right of way section. Basically, you have again uh, 10 foot travel lanes in each direction, uh, a 5 foot bicycle lane, um, and then a 5 foot uh, shoulder that is uh, striped and marked for pedestrian use. And the right of way uh, is right at the back of that shoulder. So, as the mayor mentioned, uh, FQT has an active uh, drainage project that spans the entire length of the sidewalk gap. Uh, the links to the project are from Walsingham to, are from Park uh, to the south up to Wal Walsingham to the north. Uh, the purpose of this project is really to address uh, some of the drainage and ponding issues um, that were shown in the pictures along the corridor. Um, as part of that, we're also making some pedestrian improvements, uh, adding in two p new pedestrian crosswalks. Um, 
This project actually already let for construction. The construction contract began in June of last year. Um, however, due to uh, some of the issues uh, that the mayor um, explained in his presentation, uh, we were able to take another look at the project and see what we can do to try to address some of these issues um, with pedestrian facilities in the short term. Um, so we went back to the drawing board and were able to determine that as part of this project, we will be able to fill in a portion of that sidewalk gap. Basically, uh, from Park to the south up to about 195th Street, which is where uh, the right-of-way next down to that 40-foot section, uh, we were able um, to determine that we were able to um, fill in the sidewalk gap in that section. Could you, is there a map that shows that, how far down you're going? Could you, is, is there? Yeah. So basically, um, the, the blue line is the entire um, project corridor for the drainage project, and that area outlined in green represents the uh, area that we were able to fit in sidewalk. Uh, so uh, maybe 20% of the project, of the, of the lane. Mm -hmm. Yep, right to where the right of way next down to about 40, <clears throat> 40 feet. Um, this is kind of a concept view of what that will look like within that section where we were able to fit in sidewalk. Um, basically, we are fitting in six-foot sidewalk right in the back of right-of-way. Um, it varies depending on the section of the corridor, but the goal was really to fit the sidewalk as far uh, back as we could right along the edge of the right-of-way to maximize the amount of buffer space uh, in between um, the travel lanes and the sidewalk in this section. Um, however, there is still, uh, after this project, there will still be a remaining gap from 195th um, up to Walsingham Road. Um, as we heard earlier, um, a potential project to fill in the remainder of this gap was just added to the uh, priority list. So what we've done is we've begun a planning level exercise of determining uh, what this potential future project might look like, how to best reallocate that limited space that we have to um, accomplish what we're trying to do to provide um, for pedestrians and bicycles and enhance our safety and comfort and to determine uh, how much that will cost so we can further develop the project um, and have something ready to program uh, once the project rises in priority. Um, so what we've done is we put together a few different concepts of how to best... Uh, question? Sure. Oh, I was trying to follow your, your last sentence or two, which was you're going to wait until it rises in priority before you do the pricing uh, on this area? Uh, no, so what we're doing right now is we're trying to determine um, what the project will look like conceptually. Mm -hmm. So how wide the sidewalks will be, how wide the travel lanes will be, what the impact of drainage will be, <clears throat> so that we can determine what the cost of that eventual uh, project will be. So that uh, once it raises to the point where it's um, in priority, where it's able to be funded, we'll have a project that's developed and ready to go but and have a handle on the cost before the that point. List, right. They've got to figure out what they can fund on the priority list. And once they get to that point, but we're going to be putting it in the work program. Okay. And us, us, potentially readdressing it if we have we to. could sure. okay just we just want to make sure that that option is still available yeah. yes mayor i'm oh, sorry well i've already stopped him so he might uh, yeah there. that's why i jumped yeah. <laughs> did you mention the additional project and the impacts on drainage you're currently working on a drainage pro project correct are you saying you're going to have to go back and adjust that drain are you saying that when this Whenever this new piece of the project comes forward, you might have to go back and reduce some of your drainage. Yeah, that's correct. As we'll get into when we talk about the concepts too. Um, okay. Okay. Sure. You understand why I'm asking you that, right? Sure. I think <clears throat> it they seems do. like you're doing the work it, twice, yeah. which does not sound efficient. So I'm sure you're not going to do that, right? Well, that, that, I want to make sure they're trying to accommodate a lot of things here. So um, go ahead. We have been having this conversation. Oh, okay. So I'm, I. Yeah. picked up on something common. This is something that the town discussed. of Indian Shores has brought up. Yes. Okay, because that was the first thing I heard was like, okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Um, Richard Moss, Dr District 7 Dr Director of Development. Hi. Um, the current project is to relieve the flooding within the existing sidewalk. Got it. So, so we're moving forward with that. What we're proposing to do is after, whenever we get a concept, we'll go back with a sidewalk and do it with the sidewalk at that point, a curved sidewalk. So we, yes, we will be going back and adding a sidewalk. That is the point. A curb and gutter <clears throat> sidewalk with a curb and gutter at the edge of the road. Yes. But again, that that. Well, some of the. You didn't answer my question. Are you going to be doing two two attaching two. the drainage twice? 
Yes. We're going to potentially use some of the drainage that's being installed now in the future project, but some of it will be throwaway. What do you mean by throwaway? It won't be able to be used. So to your concern, that's what he's saying, that some of it will be avoided, some of that double... Or, double know, work will yeah, be... Yeah, double work will be avoided, but some won't be avoided. And yes. I think that's... And there's no, there's no way to go back to the part that, that might be double work and, and just adjust maybe the size of the drainage, knowing you've got a future project? I mean, well, part of the problem I'm not is, saying do the sidewalk right now. I'm just saying you can't adjust the side. Well, part of the side. problem is we don't know what we're going to do there yet with the current project, so we, we wouldn't know what to put in there. But you kind of, you would have a, a sense of, I mean, sidewalk is a sidewalk. It's not a, you kind of know the drainage off of a sidewalk and the width of a sidewalk. I mean, you can, you can make a best guess, can't you, so that we don't have to do this worse. Twice. Well, what we're going to try and do with the next project is minimize the amount of pipe that, because that's where it really gets expensive when we start getting underground with the utilities. Potentially use some grading and doing some different things and using that existing drainage to minimize the amount of impacts we have with that second job. And, and really, from a timing perspective, it sounds like the drainage project will be well underway and maybe, I don't even know if completed before this next phase of uh, sidewalk additions will be uh, constructed. Yeah. And, yes, sir. Yeah. So we so we either delay. It's well, we've not, already it's, delayed yeah. the project. The project's already yeah. pretty much yeah. a year behind, yeah. I'm trying to get to this point. Yeah. Um, and we and not, so we don't we don't really have a sense of what that cost that wasted cost. No, we, we're not we're not sure where that it's gonna, what that's going to be. We're going to try and salvage everything we can yeah. and, and minimize the amount of impacts whenever we go in and put the sidewalk. Yeah. Okay. I'm not trying. To, I just want to say I'm not trying to oversimplify it. It's just I can I can understand why, you know, a pause might actually be helpful. Just to clarify, the town did request that we create one project and disrupt. The community one time, which makes total uh, sense, and it does make tons of sense. But uh, you know, this this drainage project is fixing a defined project that's been on hold. The the um, construction team was already mobilized. Uh, there would have been money lost regardless if it had been stopped. So um, the decision has been made to kind of move forward with the existing project, work out that, and do the best we can with salvaging yeah. and it. And we got about the quarter, the southern quarter half of it, like we showed earlier. We can get the sidewalk in because we do have enough right of way to do to be able to do that and not and, and get it. We really do feel like this is about the best solution we can get because otherwise, you're really upsetting what's an existing mobilized project. You're going to lose a lot of that money for no for no good value, and then you're going to come back at a time uncertain when we can get the money together and do it all once. So would I, you say with that it's a comparable amount of money? I don't know. If I'm it's, not saying exact, but I mean within reason. It's probably within a ballpark. I mean, uh, yeah, we a lot of times we don't remove work from a project, but when we do that, the contractor's definitely got the upper hand on us <clears throat> as far as negotiating that settlement. So we, we plus we feel like some of the drainage that we're installing with this project is going to be valuable for the next when we come back for that adjusted program. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure I'm I'm sure with uh, the budget you have you're going to do the best to preserve as much as you can. Uh, yes. So I mean it just makes sense for everybody so. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks Mayor. Okay. All right. Uh, go ahead. Great. Um so we developed um, a few planning level options of what uh, this longer term project might look like, how to best reallocate the space. Um, we've gone to the committees for their feedback. Uh, we based it off of some of the conversations we've been having um, with the city. And today we're just gonna give an overview of um, all the options considered and then a deep dive into uh, the option that was ended up being supported um, by all three committees. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer who's gonna give an overview of those options. So as Alex said, we're constrained with what we can do by that 40-foot section. So all of these options relate to that 40 feet of right-of-way. The first option looks at widening the lanes. So right now they're 10 feet. Looks at a 13-foot lane with a shared lane marking. So bicyclists and vehicles would share that lane with a raised sidewalk on either side. So pedestrians would have dedicated space. The second option maintains the existing 10-foot travel lanes. 
and puts that additional space into a multi-use path on either, either side. So you have an eight foot shared bicycle and pedestrian path on each side of the roadway. Option three looks at shifting all that space to one side of the roadway. So instead of having, you have the six foot sidewalk on one side and then a 10 foot two way um, shared use path on the other side. So in this option, well, we can't uh, enforce it necessarily. The expectation would be that two way bicycle traffic would happen on the east side, on the right side in this image. And that would be level with the, the road? This would be raised as well. Oh, so both the sidewalk well. and the 10 foot okay. shared use path Thank would you. be raised with the curb. And then the fourth option is a lower cost option. It allocates the space the same way as the third option, but it would be all flush. There would be no raised curb in this alternative. Um, we would be able to get some separation with flexible posts. Um, that's what you're seeing in that buffer stripe area, but it would be all the same level. So as Alex mentioned, we went to BPAC, to um, TAC, TCC and CAC. All three committees passed a motion indicating that option number two was their preference. Um, this was the option that maintained the 10 foot travel lanes and put an eight foot shared use path on either side for the bicyclists and pedestrians. Out of the three options that added curb and gutter, this is the lowest cost option. That's not why they selected it, but it's a nice benefit because we're maintaining the existing center line of the roadway. So the, if the you, existing what? I'm sorry. The existing center line of okay. the roadway. So if you look at options um, one and three, option one widens the roadway right. space, so that requires some additional rebuild work, and option three shifts the center line of the roadway, mm -hmm. so that requires additional rebuild, whereas option two maintains the existing roadway. So I think this will cost about $10 million, including those drainage improvements. There are some other things we'll need to consider over time. There's been encroachments into the public right-of-way with mailboxes, driveway, parking. All of these options would use the full 40 feet of available right-of-way, so these things would need to be reclaimed, um, and there may be some parking that needs to be reworked as part of that. This would also require a temporary construction easement because, again, we're using the full 40 feet of right-of-way for the roadway and we need about three foot temporary easement on each side during the construction period. May I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Michelle. So I guess because <clears throat> I already had reviewed this entire presentation, so you do not have to take right-of-way on any of these options? Correct. <laughs> Correct. No takings? Correct. Okay. but. You're saying that in a lot of cases, people put mailboxes or driveways, especially in the 60-foot section? Within the 40-foot section. I mean, within the public <clears throat> right-of-way. Within right. the 40-foot. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I have more questions later. Thank you. <clears throat> They've also been built fences and outdoor dining areas. I mean, there's a whole mm -hmm. menagerie of things that I, are out there. No, um, so we, we've <laughs> talked about this a bit already, but the like options one through three would require a uh, curb and gutter and that complete overhaul of the drainage system um, in addition to the drainage improvements that are going on now. Phone systems or something. Um, so with that, we can take more questions. <coughs> Council Member Rice. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm kind of amazed that in the almost half an hour we've been discussing this, the word resiliency hasn't popped up. Um, what kind of work have you done or maybe consulted working with the county that's taking sea level rise and resiliency into consideration and using that as part of like a cost-benefit risk analysis for how to put the type of money that we need to in this project, recognizing what the threats will be in the future? It's not something that we've looked at yet, but we're still very early on in this planning effort, so um, something we can look into more. Well, if, I mean, and I don't know why there's, if how much the flooding has to do with the fact that if it's high tide, and there's nowhere for the money, the, nowhere for the, <laughs> no more, nowhere for the water to go, then, then, you know, I'm just wondering, I just want to spin, you've made an excellent case for why we need to address these safety issues. I just want to make sure that the taxpayer money that we put into it, that we're fixing it right. Good 
point? Uh, yeah, Commissioner. Um, have you considered um, whether you need to still provide parking on um, basically, and I think it's First Avenue to Walsingham? Um, the 60 foot sorry, section. it's yeah, before so that. The northern <clears throat> so Eastern Seawater First Avenue. In the 60 foot section, we would have. I can't hear you. In the 60 foot section, there is additional space where we could look at maintaining the parking, um, but we are trying. We're looking right now just at options for the sidewalk, and so using the 40 foot section as the the limiting factor for that. But there are still other things that would fit in the 60 foot I mean, space. Have you asked the residents who live there whether they want street parking? Not at this time. Might want to. You're talking yeah, about even. You're talking about it, even in the 40 foot right of way area, or the 60. No, the 50 to 60 foot right away oh, is, but okay. it's the basically. I think it's First Avenue to Walsingham. Um, the other question I have is, so the footprint that's out there now, with the exception of where people have encroached, you're not going any wider or any different. We do not require additional public right of way, but there are private uses that are currently using the, pri the public right of way. I mean, where people put stuff on right of way, but where it's the footprint where it is now, it's not going to go any wider. Correct. Okay. And um, let's see. have we, um, I guess, and I talked with the secretary briefly after a T barter meeting, but. And we talked about this years ago when we were trying to plan this roadway. And obviously, we did the impervious asphalt and did a bike path and a sidewalk on both sides because we were told we had to. Why couldn't we put, you're considering in one case, a bike path and a sidewalk on one side and a sidewalk on the other? I mean, why not do something like that instead of having to make this extra? Wide. The comments from I think or it was narrowing the, the yeah. lanes of the road. Right. I think, I think it was the BPAC. Mm -hmm. It might have been the TCC. They were concerned about <clears throat> bicyclists having to travel in both directions on the same side of the road. They wanted the option for one-way bicycle traffic on each side, and they felt like if bicyclists were were facing traffic at a fairly close distance to traffic, that would be very uncomfortable. And so that their preference was to have the separated I know. facility. That was the preference back then, but um, that was the preference that we heard at the May BPAC meeting. And that's what they still want to do. <clears throat> Correct. And keep in mind that the ten foot travel lanes would be shared lane markings. So confident, capable, um, faster bicyclists can still use the main travel lane. And the problem with a wide -er travel lane is that then cars try to squeeze past them without going over the yellow stripe. And that creates a real problem with the three-foot buffer that's required. Um, so uh, most bicyclists prefer a narrower travel lane and have motorists change lanes to pass. Because if you have a 13-foot lane, they will absolutely try to squeeze past you, and 13 feet is not a shareable lane. Um, and um, yeah. <laughs> you have an idea. I saw the one chart where one shows one's more expensive than the other. So... Um, could you go back to that slide? Yeah, can please? you go back to that chart? So what's the final option that you are suggesting? Option two? Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't, we're not suggesting a preferred option. This is the option that the three committees mm -hmm. have issued as a preferred option. Okay. Will the county have to relocate any of its utilities? I'm not sure. Um, I'd like to know that because obviously we relocated them probably before and that could be a considerable expense to Somebody the county. Somebody coming up to address that. <laughs> yeah, I would anticipate more utility relocations. We're going to have to relocate them again? Well, I, I, with where they're at now that's being relocated, if we can salvage that, they won't have to be relocated. Okay. Because they're I, already being relocated, and we would just, hopefully we, we could get it out of the way mm -hmm. and coordinate that. And I guess the other messy part of all of this is all the undergrounding of the utilities that's going on right now. Um, yeah. That happened in that stretch of Indian Rocks Beach that I was talking about. Again, we, well, we've discussed and what we've, some of the, the um, concepts that I've, you know, outside of this, you know, construction was, 
we could potentially do get out of all the piping, not all of the piping, but we're going to try to minimize the amount of piping that we do and actually use the road to drain it to a location and then get it to an outfall location. I'm not going to say that's going to happen everywhere, but we're going to definitely try to minimize the amount of um, utility impacts that we've had. And, and we did that with this project as well that we've got going on out there currently. Okay. Mayor Bajowski. Thank you. Mayor Bajowski. Um, on the option two, I, I see in your diagram it shows, is it two inch, two foot curb and gutter? Two foot. So that's included in, in the project. Yes. So when you say curb and gutter, you're, there, is there an actual curb to keep a tire from f going across the line to get to the pedestrian? Yeah. Yes, there's okay. a, a vertical curb. Okay, and the pedestrian is, but the pedestrian access is still flat, mm -hmm. not raised. No. Raised from the road. It is raised. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. Got it. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Well, and to elaborate, is this a Miami curb or is it a vertical curb? <sighs> that, has, that was discussed in the committee meetings as well, so it's something that we'll be looking into different options for the curb. Hard to hear you. That was something that was discussed by the committee, so we'll be looking at different options for the curb as we move forward. So that hasn't been decided yet, what type of curb. Um, <clears throat> the, the rounded curb doesn't do the same job for protecting as the right. vertical curb. Right. But I'm sure that... It would probably it be a vertical. type F curb, yeah. which would have a six-foot... Six-inch. Six a foot-and-a-half uh, six gutter inch. and then a six-inch... Uh, raise me, raise curve. Same one you see on Mozart Road. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. One more question. Hmm? Have you spoken with um, the community on this, the citizen, the city? Um, I'm sorry. What was it? Have you FDOT worked with Indian Shores on this issue? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And are they in agreement on Here's option two? Mayor, do you want to come up? That's a tough question to answer. Um, to your point, and to your point, uh, Commissioner Seal, um, I would much rather have one project and one situation with respect to uh, ripping up Gulf Boulevard and then coming back again and rip it up a second time. Um, to the extent that um, the uh, the initial project can install equipment, piping, et cetera, that would reduce the amount of additional work that would need to be done to put curbs and sidewalks. That would be a good thing. Uh, but, <clears throat> I mean, the ideal situation, I, I mean, it's pretty obvious, I, is, is just one project. I mean, I can't, I can't deny that. Uh, but but let, I don't disagree with you. But let's, for just as the sake of saying, if that's not an option, I'm asking, is option two out of the four options they've proposed that have gone before our, these four options <laughs> that have gone before our advisory committees, is your city in agreement with option two, what they're proposing? Whether they did we it at the same time or at a different time? We have not had a formal vote, if that's, you know, if that's what you're asking. Um, I don't know if this is cast in concrete. These are just recommendations at this point. Uh, the eight foot, I think, you know, we're talking okay. about the eight foot sidewalk. So I guess where I'm going is if <clears throat> it's asked at the end of your PowerPoint, it's asking us for our feedback and, and possibly approval of something. Well, what we're asking is first of all, all the Department of Transportation needs right now is for us to put it on the priority list. Right. So we've done that. You've already taken that vote. Okay. Uh, in addition, our staff feels like it would be helpful to have uh, a recommendation to the department on one of these options so that they can continue to go and, and, and work on that option and refine that option as we go forward. That is not necessary right now. We have worked very closely with the mayor and his team, and there have been several meetings to go over these options, and they were involved in every one of our committee meetings. 
where these options were presented and they were able to give their input. So, um, I mean, I, I get that, but I feel like it's been a good partnership yes. to come to option two at this point, unless you tell me differently. Well, uh, <laughs> to, to your point, I thought we were just basically getting on the priority list. Yes. Okay, and that was, that was the first step. That is what the final design would be, um, you know, I haven't submitted that to, to our council um, at this point. Uh, so I thought we were at kind of step one. You've kind of morphed into step two in terms of actually approving the design. And oh, we're not approving a design. This is okay. a planning right. concept, and th this will go into design, and there'll be a lot of opportunity. Okay. Alex, <laughs> tell me if I'm saying something nope. different. Yeah, absolutely. This is just an <laughs> exercise so we can begin yeah. advancing the project, developing projects. Yeah, just we, we, don't, we don't even have good yet. costs right now. We have planning level costs. So I think we would absolutely, you know, there's no um, timetable for any of this. I think we need to go back to the town and have that kind of public absolutely. forum and work with the council on a lot of this. But first, we've got to have something that we feel like they can continue to, to refine and flesh out. And we're at that point at a planning level, right? And, and, and without having costs, without having costs in all this, forget the disruption, which is a big deal that you're talking about. <clears throat> It's hard to make good decisions. I mean, we're not here to do that anyway, but it's hard to mm -hmm. kind of arrive at something that the, the as they say, you know, telling telling the, the contractor to go away and all the costs that are associated with that, and then looking at the four options and the costs associated with that and the duplication or the wasted work and what that cost is. And so there's a lot of issues that are kind of floating around right now that it's hard to, and this project is moving forward. So. It's all kind of moving around at the same time. It's pretty. It's pretty difficult uh, to come arriving at the perfect solution right now without those that input. So, um, Commissioner, there is no perfect yeah, solution. That's yeah. that's one of the problems <laughs> yeah. because of the. So. I just want to make sure whatever we do at the end of this discussion acknowledges that that we as a board aren't saying only look at option two if the, if the community no, no, we're not, themselves... that's not where we're going, at least uh, that's what okay. I'm hearing. If the community themselves has not weighed in. Commissioner Sofer. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm not quite wrapping my head around this, and my apologies for probably asking the same question, but what's the true catalyst behind not combining these two projects together? What am I, what am I missing here that we can't put them together and just... Timing. Do it all at it's one time. It's timing. Right. One, one's going on right now. Yeah. Let's have the secretary answer that. I was going to, you know, uh, I asked all these same questions because, quite honestly, one of the first times I even learned about this project when it was already led to a contractor and somebody said, this is what we're doing. And I, my first question, why didn't we do a sidewalk? So a lot of the questions that you have are similar questions. And so I dug back into the history. And from what I can gather, the, 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 this current project, one of the big issues was that when it rained, the puddling got so bad that people were walking out into the travel lanes and they weren't able to get around even in the lane that was set aside. And the original impervious pavement, whether that was a good idea or not, um, it obviously didn't work. Um, and so we put state funds on this project to try to solve the drainage project. We, I don't think there's any MPO funds it was state money, which, um, you know, when you look at the state money that we have, is, you know, that's not MPO related or CIS related. It's not a lot. And so we, we, we did use what we could to try to fix the more immediate problem. The, um, we'd love to get the sidewalks in there. I'd love to have sidewalks out there. I know, I know it's an issue. One of the things that I think we got to remember, and we'll, we'll talk about delaying this project, is, is one, when, when will we have the money to do the next <coughs> one? But second, once you throw federal money in there, if we do that, we open up a whole different set of issues that we have to address and the biggest one being we, we really couldn't build this project mm -hmm. within our existing right-of-way we won't need new right-of-way but we got to go outside the right-of-way to build it because when you think we're both vertically and horizontally constrained we're horizontally constrained by the 40 feet we're vertically constrained because you can't just say build the sidewalks up and make it higher so it drains better, but then you have a, a, a two-foot drop-off to the property that's adjacent. you got to find a way to harmonize the road back into the adjacent property. If it was the city or even us going out there, we work something out with the, with the property owner, they say, oh, yeah, we're willing to just let you do it. We sign an agreement. When you go into the federal process, and this is what happens, we have to go to those property owners, and we have to say, this is what this is worth. And then they can still say, oh, we don't want the money. 
But many times what we find is, is when you start showing them how much money you're willing, that is worth and that we have to offer them because it's under the federal process, a lot of them start to say, well, you know, I, that's not bad money. I might want to have that money. And when you do that, you start adding a lot of costs. And then they also say, well, what do you mean you're taking my, my mailbox? Or I can't have my mm -hmm. stuff that's already encroached in the right way. I'm no longer willing to give you that easement. And so there's some things we have to work out related to that if we put federal money on it that could extend this process out longer because when you start doing these easement, it takes a while. Legal, you got to do appraisals, you got to do all kind of stuff. So I I'm saying if we, if we did try to combine the projects, we may push out the things that we're going to get done in the next year or so that would hopefully at least solve the more immediate drainage issues. Um, we may push that out and then not necessarily know when we're going to be able to get back out there and do the sidewalk. But I think we, we're committed to do the sidewalks. I just think that we're going to be in a two-phase project as, as much as it's kind of distasteful to have to do that. But I think where we're at now, that's probably our best option, um, although imperfect, no doubt. And the original cost estimates this, if I remember right, we're in the $40 million range. It was very big, yeah. yeah. It's There's so nowhere to put the water. It's, <clears throat> there's so much out there, and that 40 foot has been used for just about everything over the years and trying to fit our stuff in there, and it's not easy. I had the comment about the interstate the other day, or a little while ago, about bird in the hand, and I think we're kind of there. We've got something we can do to make improvements now, yeah. and uh, it'll be a lot more expensive, and, it'll, and it's unknown when we'll get it done if we try to combine. Uh, Mary, <coughs> did you have a question for the secretary? Did you have uh, just... I thought you had yeah, it. I just want to okay. wrap up. Thank you. I wanted, thank you first, thank I you, wanted Secretary. to thank you. Uh, we When we called, it was about a year ago, and it was within 48 hours that Secretary Grund came out. Pretty much every question that's been asked today, uh, we brought up at the meeting with uh, Mayor Pat and the fact of using, you know, monies twice and going back and the impervious service problems plus the drainage issues and uh, just even, you know, disrupting Gulf Boulevard, which if you noticed in that one picture <coughs> where Salt Rock was, this this picture was taken when it, we weren't even in season. There were seven people walking down that street. So, I mean, it's not like this doesn't need to be done. <coughs> and the other thing is the cities are working together. We're all working very closely together. And um, Stephen Benson calls me all the time just to make sure that everyone is together on what we're doing. So, and the fact that we could bring down the project from 40 million to, you know, to what we have now. And uh, again, Secretary Gwen and the FDOT have been wonderful to help us because, you know, at first seeing all of these things, plus we have been having problems on Gulf Boulevard with safety issues. So uh, I want to thank you for helping us and being a part of this. And I, I really think that, um, the options that are yeah. we are looking at are good options, and um, I hope that we will continue with <coughs> this project in that manner. Yeah, well, thank you for the perspective. I mean, I think we're all just kind of going through a little bit of that learning curve like you've already gone through. Uh, and so just trying it out a little bit and getting a few questions answered, but I appreciate the perspective that uh, – are you okay down there, Commissioner? Uh, uh, Mayor Bradbury. Yes. <laughs> Um, a, a couple of different questions, if you don't mind. One, when we're doing, when you guys are working on the drainage now. Excuse um, me, Mary, is this for the uh, secretary? I didn't, uh, or for the consultant? Kind of both. Okay. <laughs> um, you're working on the drainage now. So I'm assuming that you're going to have to repaint <coughs> the road. To re Restripe the road after you're done tearing it all up. Yeah, we'll have new, new pavement and striping on top of the pavement. I mean, we'll okay. sure we disturb the pavement. Right. Yeah, we're, no. you see, this is kind of like we're not doing the whole road. We're doing portions, areas yeah. that had the flooding. We try and address those. So. Well, and then the reason why I was asking is because maybe those could be kind of restriped towards these options to kind of start getting the ball rolling and, and get the enthusiasm from the citizens as well as for the other. And the second is I wanted to see the picture of the things that are in the right of way again, because it looks like there's not only, um, mm -hmm. so there's one more picture that you guys had. There we go. Mm -hmm. It's not only businesses that are encroaching, but it looks like there's utilities that are encroaching into like the right of way. Like a fire hydrant. 
fire hydrant that looks like some kind of uh, electrical, like telephone, telecommunication, yeah. something yeah. of that nature. That when you have an eight foot sidewalk, though, is there's certain places where we may have to. It may go. To, we need ADA requirements. We got to meet. But for sure. instance, if you have an eight foot sidewalk, you could have a box down in there for a pinch point if you would around it. So we would need to relook really all of that. But for instance, if your mailbox is there. You know, we're not going to necessarily want the mailman to be stopping everywhere along the road. He may have to find a oh, way the to U.S. Postal Service wants you to stop everywhere along the road. They don't want to have to walk up to your house. Well, or find or a community to your box. Or, I don't know. But yeah. there's certain things that will just be harder. But those we wouldn't have to, with an eight-foot sidewalk, as long as we keep with it four to five foot at pitch point. Four foot minimum. Yeah, so as long as we, at some points, we can get down to that point. Because I, you know, that was one thing, uh, a, a good option that uh, Commissioner Seal brought up was, you know, are, are we going to have to relocate all that stuff again? And it looks like it's not only possibly the county, but it looks like there's a lot of mm -hmm. business items, you know, like the, the gas lines, water lines, and things of that nature. That well, if they're under the <coughs> sidewalk, it's, it's not as bad under the sidewalk as the road. But at, where you get further north, when you get into, like, the Indy Rocks Beach, and then you run into challenges where you have parking that we would have to Where the business put, has been like utilizing you, something that wasn't theirs, yes. Yeah, and you can't back up over the sidewalk. That, mm -hmm. So there's other issues out there, but we will, you know, none of them are insurmountable. We, we work with them, but. I fear for the drainage because I know a lot of those areas are completely flush with the road. Mm -hmm. And like you said, when you start putting a sidewalk in yeah. with the six inch. D type carb. I know. There's major problems coming. Okay, I think we've um, <laughs> we've um, squeezed this one out as far as we're going to squeeze it today. All right. Um, I mean, I just want uh, if you could restate the action that you're looking for today, that would be helpful. So the action <clears throat> today is that we would like a recommendation on the preferred concept of this board to provide some additional direction to DOT and support for the work they're doing. Again, you've already done the main action, which is to prioritize the project. I will make a motion, Gulf Boulevard drainage sidewalk project recommendations. Uh, uh, concept two. Concept two. Second. Yeah. A second. Susie, so, so. Okay. All in up question. Just Quickly. want to, yes. for the record, state this is, as, as uh, Mayor Buljowski said, pending the input from the community, from the local community. Yes, yep. that's fine. It was pending a whole lot of things, but yes. Yeah. That, okay. <laughs> and also finding out about costs for the county. Right. We will keep track of that. This is just that first jump off point. That's right. Okay. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> All right. Thank now. you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, for being here, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we're going to go back to Rodney. Yeah. All right. Um, Rodney, you ready to come up and talk about Advantage Pinellas, please? Update. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. All right. Are you going to give us the Chelsea speed update? <laughs> <laughs> We're all on like Chelsea I'm speed now. Uh, we, we, you know, Chelsea provides good. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I can match her pace, but I'll do my yeah. best. And I think it's her been pace a good. Is quite quick, but we yeah. can't understand her all the time. Mm -hmm. The previous uh, discussion is a good segue, I believe, into what we're going to talk about in terms of Vanish Pinellas and uh, what we've been working on with our partners in the region to look at resiliency uh, in a regional framework. So this is a study that we've been working on for about a year uh, that is uh, funded by the Federal Highway Administration. And what we're calling it is Resilient Tampa Bay Transportation. So I'll spend the next few minutes to give you an overview of the project, talk about some of the scenarios that we have modeled, and then how that relates to what we have identified as some critical infrastructure in the region. Uh, look at some represent representative project corridors, and then lastly talk about next steps. 
Uh, I'm not a scientist, um, and I won't try to play one here for you, but I have been working on these sort of issues for about five years now, and I've been in various forums and presentations and tend to um, come across some good information. And so I tend to borrow some of that uh, from different presenters. And what you're looking at here is something that I was able to borrow from the Army Corps about um, five years ago, I was in a presentation with uh, one of their uh, key people in the Southeast Florida area, and he talked about some of the legwork they had done to set the table for the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Compact. And so what, this tr what these series of images are showing you is information that was put together by the University of Miami. Uh, they were a key stakeholder in that climate compact, but what it's showing you is how Florida's uh, coastline has changed over time. And I'm not talking about 10 or 20 years. Uh, they uh, were able to go back to uh, the uh, image to the left about 120,000 years. And to show uh, the coastline when you had about 20 feet uh, more of sea level than we currently have. The image in the middle is about 18,000 years ago and it shows you about a reduction at about 120 meters in sea level and then today is obviously the image over to the far right. So again, the message I took from it was that the uh, coastline uh, has changed over time and the geologists and, and the like can go back far enough to show you how uh, that has occurred. Also, uh, things are evolving. The science is becoming more clear and uh, adaptation planning is becoming more important because of things like the rise in sea levels. And so, for example, uh, it took about 60 years for the sea level to rise about six inches, but now the scientists are projecting that it'll take about 20 years for that same six inches to rise into the future. Uh, the models are also projecting a significant increase in the amount of category four and five hurricanes, as well as uh, we are seeing a rise in temperatures and the amount of pervious, or sorry, impervious surface that we are uh, building here in this part of Florida is uh, causing more inland flooding, a lot similar to what you saw in the previous discussion in Indian Shores and Indian Rocks Beach. So how this relates to the long range plan is very simple. Uh, the FAST Act uh, requires that we look at these uh, sort of impacts we have to consider projects and strategies to improve the resilience and reliability of the transportation system, including ways to mitigate these uh, stormwater uh, conditions. Uh, one of the ways that we found effective to do this is to have a vulnerability, a vulnerability assessment, and that includes things or analysis of things like inland flooding, storm surge, and sea level rise. We also, as you probably recall, went out to the public uh, early on in the long-range process with a uh, survey of the residents to, to determine what their planning priorities should be uh, for us as we move forward in the long-range planning process. And we were encouraged to see that increasing resiliency to climate-related hazards. 85% uh, of the population felt that that was very important or important. And then on the chart to the right, uh, Increasing resiliency to climate-related hazards was the second most important uh, planning priority just behind uh, the efficiency of the transportation network. So there's acknowledgement from the residents of the county that climate uh, hazards are real and that we need to better plan for those. Another point or another way this is illustrated is in some of the infrastructure decision making that has occurred in the recent past. Uh, what you see here is an example of some information from uh, the PD&E for the Dunedin Bridge, uh, Dunedin Bridges cause, uh, Causeway Bridges uh, study, where the county was looking at options to replace uh, that bridge, whether it be a no build, a major rehab, or a complete replacement. And what you see on the slide to the right is uh, the lifespan of that bridge. So you're talking about a 75 year life, uh, lifespan for that bridge and that piece of infrastructure. And so the county commission added a task to look at sea level rise to ensure that if the bridge were to be replaced, that it would be built, put back in a condition where it would be more resilient uh, given the projected rise in sea levels. So on with all the information, we uh, had meetings with our counterparts in Pinella, or excuse me, in Pasco and Hillsborough County, as well as with the Regional Planning Council and DOT to see if we could work on a joint project to look at uh, vulnerability in a, at a regional scale. And fortunately, we um, 
came up with a creative approach where we would look at sea level rise uh, based on the NOAA curves, uh, the high curve and the intermediate low, as well as increased precipitation, excuse me, uh, nine inches in 24 hours and 33 inches over 72 hours, as well as categories one, three, and five storm surges on uh, the transportation network. We would then look at how that impacts the regional economy and then develop adaptation and mitigation strategies. Uh, when it comes to sea level rise and those two curves, uh, what we uh, projected to analyze was about 0.83 feet on the low end and a little over two feet on the high end using the information uh, contained in the tide gauge out at Clearwater Beach. So we were one of 11 pilot projects that were awarded funding and you see that it was both uh, coastal uh, communities as well as uh, communities uh, in the inland part of the country because climate change manifests itself in different ways. In order for us to move forward with the project, we had to determine what was most critical uh, in terms of the transportation network here in the Tampa Bay area, and we uh, conducted a two-phase approach, the first being a qualitative assessment where we went and talked to various stakeholders and experts. We got information on those persi persistent flooding locations, as well as looking at all hazards analysis and other mitigation plans. Uh, we then married that up with a quantitative assessment, which was really GIS-based, looking at uh, the transportation disadvantage and those social and economic uh, factors to determine what was most sensitive and what was uh, adaptive. So what you see here is uh, a table on the right that shows you the variables that we used in the criticality analysis and the weights that we gave to the various uh, variables. So things like evacuation routes, uh, higher volume roadways, uh, areas that are proxim uh, proximate to economic and social activity centers and areas that had a lot of people were weighted highest. We also uh, gave greater weight to uh, employment centers as well as those areas where people didn't have access to a private automobile. And then we also gave uh, weight down there at the bottom to our disadvantaged populations and our environmental justice areas. The map to the right, or excuse me, to the left shows you uh, the various levels of criticality with the uh, road segments in red being those that were most critical, the ones in yellow being a moderate criticality, and the ones in green being uh, on the low end of the scale. Uh, the second part of that analysis was to look at the vulnerability of the road system. And so what you're looking at here is a chart of uh, the road a network in Hillsborough in blue, Pinellas in orange, and Pasco in gray, and the various uh, scenarios in which uh, inundation occurs. And obviously, almost under uh, every scenario, Pinellas County has uh, the most lane miles impacted by these various uh, scenarios. We then moved on to look at what could be done uh, to mitigate or adapt some of our assets uh, given these uh, conditions. And so each MPO chose two road uh, corridors within uh, their county for further analysis. Uh, in Pinellas County, we chose a stretch of Gulf Boulevard in the Madera Beach area, as well as a portion of Roosevelt Boulevard from Ormerton uh, to Gandy in the Gateway area. In Hillsborough, they chose a section of Big Bend Road as well as the Gandy Boulevard, or excuse me, the Gandy Bridge replacement. And then in Pasco County, they chose a section of US 19 and State Road 54. So where we are now in the study is uh, sort of in the third uh, phase where we're looking at adaptation strategies and econometric analysis. And we'll be moving into uh, the final report for the project in the fall. So we'll be moving forward with uh, that econometric modeling We'll look at uh, finalizing the adaptation measures. Uh, Council Member Rice, you asked about, you know, what can you do on Gulf Boulevard, for example, to make sure that you build it the right way so it's more resilient. And that's what that toolbox of strategy is really intended to do. It's, it's a matrix of a host of both uh, softscape improvements as well as hardscape improvements that you could apply to transportation projects. And we'll use that as a means to um, inform some of the decision making and have, by having it incorporated in a long range plan. Uh, we'll continue to uh, go out to our stakeholders and coordinate with our, our regional partners on the project. 
And lastly, I'd say uh, in my work in this area, there really is no silver bullet. There's no one thing you can do. Uh, you're gonna it's gonna require an ongoing uh, commitment. And uh, I've just listed here uh, a list of um, organizations or um, agencies or um, bodies that are um, key in helping to keep uh, the momentum going and helping uh, do good resiliency planning. And um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Any questions? Comments for Rodney? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate Great, it. Rodney. Appreciate it. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay. Waning, waning enthusiasm as the afternoon goes on. <laughs> <laughs> the project explanations get shorter. This will all get wrapped up into the long range plan, and then you'll see it again. Um, all right, we are moving on, We're on to, to E now. E, um, proposed amendments to the countywide plan. So we're going to bring up Linda Fisher to <coughs> discuss that with you. Um, so the countywide plan coordinates land use through uh, uh, out all 25 local governments. Um, and this board works with the plan each month as you review countywide plan map amendments. Um, but the plan also provides a framework that implements the land use vision uh, for all of Pinellas County, including priorities like uh, supporting a future transit system. And staff periodically recommends that you update this document uh, in response to changing uh, conditions and needs. So uh, that's why I'm here today. Um, but before we get to our recommended changes, uh, I'd just like to briefly remind you of, of what's in the plan um, before we talk about changes. So uh, the foundation uh, goes back to, uh, of the current plan goes back to 2005 when we had a major five-year community visioning effort called Pinellas by Design, and um, I'm sure some of you remember that very well. Um, at that point, we were transitioning from being a mostly suburban county to one that was starting to see some urban redevelopment. And the consensus of Pinellas by Design was to identify areas of the county where that urban redevelopment should go. Um, and that included our downtowns and town centers, our major roadways, areas that we could someday connect uh, with enhanced transit. Um, so we began integrating this vision into the countywide plan. Um, we made some gradual updates initially, and then in um, 2015, with input from a working group of local government planning directors, uh, the board actually adopted a whole new countywide plan um, with a, a new framework for that centers and corridors network. Um, and we show that on what's called the uh, transit-oriented land use vision map, which you see on your screen. Um, we adopted two new categories, activity center and multimodal corridor, and each of those has a number of subcategories with different levels of density and intensity. And uh, we did this in the same time frame as the green light effort. So uh, we coordinated the two plans very closely, uh, and we used the planned light rail and uh, bus corridors from green light on the, on the map. And this is still the map that we have in the plan today. Um, we also recognized the existing centers and corridors uh, that had already been adopted in the past through um, what we call our special area plan process, and I'll talk more about that as we go along. Um, now, in 2015, we also uh, adopted what's called the tiered amendment process. Uh, prior to that time, any amendment to a local future land use map was treated exactly the same uh, by the countywide plan. It went through exactly the same uh, set of countywide reviews and public hearings. Um, but under the current uh, tiered amendment process, now there are some very minor amendments that don't require public hearings. Um, those just require a staff level review, and we call those tier one reviews. Um, tier two amendments are just the typical countywide plan map amendments that this board reviews every month, except for this month when you didn't have any. And um, that includes the, uh, also includes the activity center and multimodal corridor categories if they meet the locational criteria of this map. Um, that means uh, that they are in a location where we've planned for transit to support the densities and intensities that are being uh, requested. And tier three amendments are just the opposite. Um, they're for activity centers and multimodal corridors uh, that don't meet uh, the criteria of this map. And uh, those amendments have a much higher standard of, of review and justification. And I'll show you an example of how that works. Um, I'm gonna use pictures of developments uh, from around Pinellas County. They're not gonna be pointing to the, the places on the map where the buildings are actually located, but they're just to illustrate different densities and intensities. 
Um, now the blue corridors on this map are uh, just basic local bus service, and those are considered appropriate for the least intense category of uh, subcategory of the activity center category, and that's called neighborhood center, um, and that's basically uh, like a townhome level of development. Um, the yellow corridors uh, were planned in, in the green light plan for uh, frequent local bus service, which comes more often and uh, has fewer stops. So that would qualify for the next level up, which is community center. And that allows somewhat denser multifamily buildings. Um, the red corridors represent high frequency, high capacity bus service. Uh, so uh, the highest level of activity center that we currently have, major center, uh, could go in those locations. And those, those allow even denser multifamily buildings. So all these amendments would meet the locational criteria of this map, and that means they would just be regular tier two amendments. Um, but if you wanted to exceed the criteria, say you wanted to put a community center on a local bus route, um, then that would require the more stringent tier three level of review. So there's a built-in regulatory disincentive for not coordinating your activity centers with transit planning. Um, now again, these are, the, these are the densities and intensities that we have in the plan today. Um, they are somewhat higher than the regular residential and commercial type categories that we use throughout the county. But for the type of development that's needed to support a, a transit system, these are really on the low end. Um, in some cases, they're far below what's already been adopted uh, through that special area plan process. For example, the, uh, the city of St. Pete allows a floor area ratio of 8.0 in its downtown. Um, we did grandfather all the existing special area plans at whatever densities uh, they had previously adopted, um, but any expansion of those essentially non-conforming <coughs> activity centers would need to be reviewed as a Tier 3. And in fact, the only Tier 3 that we've had since we've adopted this plan uh, was St. Petersburg's Innovation District at the south end of their downtown. So overall, the plan we have today is, is pretty conservative. Um, and there are reasons for that. The, um, the current plan was geared towards supporting a central light rail line. Um, we actually created four additional subcategories of activity center of just for those station areas, which we called Transit Station Center 1 through 4. Um, but at that time, we were also dealing with the effects of the recession, which had uh, significantly depressed our redevelopment market. Um, so we were uh, very conservative with not allowing these densities to go anywhere except in uh, very small areas around the, the transit stations uh, when we knew that they were coming. And unfortunately, the, the green light effort came to an early end, so no one has ever been able to use these, these transit station centers. Um, so since we adopted these provisions in 2015, of course, Pinellas has seen a lot of changes. Um, there's been a pretty dramatic resurgence in the redevelopment market. Um, in terms of transit planning, we're no longer looking at a single light rail line. We're now looking at a more distributed uh, network of bus rapid transit. And uh, we just have much more opportunity to build on our centers and corridors network uh, in a way that will truly lay the groundwork for a transit system. Um, so in response to those changes, uh, staff has been working with the Planners Advisory Committee uh, to draft a package of countywide plan amendments for your consideration. Um, our staff has also met individually with uh, staff of every local government that has an activity center or a multimodal corridor. Um, and we've taken all their <coughs> input into account, and we're hearing a lot of support for this package. Um, it has a revised framework for adopting and amending activity centers and multimodal corridors, takes all those grandfathered special area plans and makes them conforming. And uh, it allows truly transit-oriented development to be created in more places in coordination with uh, our current transit planning. So here's what's in the package. Um, the first thing we're recommending is to update the transit-oriented land use vision map. Um, we are proposing shortening the name to land use strategy map because it's easier to say. Um, the new version would work uh, the same as the current one. It continues to show future transit investment corridors that uh, provide locational criteria for activity centers and multimodal corridors. Um, but the green light, corridor, green light bus corridors would be replaced by the uh, Advantage Pinellas Transit Needs Plan, which was presented to the board last month. Um, now, these proposed locational corridors are not all that different from uh, the current version. 
but there is a new premium transit corridor designation to recognize the Central Avenue BRT. Now the board has uh, previously given us direction to continue recognizing the green light light rail line in some way uh, because the corridors it follows still have very strong transit potential. Um, so these corridors are still shown on the map as future transit investment corridors, just not as a specific mode of transit <coughs> like light rail. And uh, you can see the path, excuse me. <coughs> um, <coughs> next, we are recommending that these standards for activity centers and multimodal corridors be revised. I apologize, I have frogs living in my throat all of a sudden. Uh, it's allergy time. season. You can hear us all coughing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so we are recommending that um, standards be revised to allow these <coughs> transit-oriented densities and intensities to be adopted uh, under the <coughs> Tier 2 process. All of the current Tier 2 uh, requirements would still continue. It would just lift uh, the limits at which that Tier 3 regulatory disincentive kicks in. Um, looking at activity centers, these are intended to be important centers of the community. Uh, concentrated jobs and population, retail and entertainment, within walking distance of existing or future transit hubs. Currently, there are eight different subcategories uh, of the activity center category, in, which includes that grandfathered uh, special area plan and those unusable transit station centers. So we're proposing to reduce those to four. Um, using the transit station center uh, densities and intensities. And I'll take you through some visual examples of the changes we're proposing. Uh, again, using examples of development that we already have here in Pinellas. <coughs> um, before I do that, I just wanted to say a few words about how we show density. Um, for example, this is a multifamily building, typical building that has about 40 units to the acre. Um, but actually, so is this one. Uh, it just has a few units, but uh, it's on a very small parcel, and that's just how the math works out. And believe it or not, this building is also 40 units an acre. Um, these are very large, very luxurious condo units that each have their own private elevator. Um, so uh, the purpose of this is just to illustrate that when we talk about specific densities and intensities, it's not in a vacuum. Each local government has its own design uh, uh, requirements that will uh, allow these densities to fit in with the character of its own community. Now I'm going to stick to more typical examples like the one in the middle. Um, so let's talk about the, the standards that we have today. Um, neighborhood center again is the uh, least dense type of activity center. Um, these are uh, designed to be a destination for a neighborhood or a group of neighborhoods. Um, but the standards that we have are, are fairly low density. They're only uh, 15 units to the acre, about a, a townhome level of development. And that's really not very supportive of transit. So we're recommending an increase to 60 units an acre and 2.0 floor area ratio. This is the equivalent to the transit station center type 4 in the current plan. That's the lowest level of transit station center. Uh, and this provides enough critical mass for a, a smaller transit st uh, station area. Um, it allows for some vertical development and a, a healthy mix of uses. Um, the next level up is community center. Uh, these are typically smaller downtowns and town centers, which includes the majority of uh, our current special area plans. And um, the standards that we have today are really just at the low end of what's needed to support transit. Uh, we recommend increasing community center to 90 units an acre and 3.0 floor area ratio. And that's equivalent to transit station center type 3. Um, the next highest subcategory is major center. Uh, these are typically larger downtowns or redevelopment areas that have significant employment. Um, this is currently the highest density and intensity that is allowed under the Tier 2 process. And as I mentioned, it's quite a, a bit below uh, the existing standards for some of our existing special area plans. So for this subcategory, we're proposing 150 units an acre and 5.0 floor area ratio. Um, that's equivalent to transit station center type 2. But this is actually still below some of the densities we have in Pinellas County. So in order to make sure that every activity center is conforming, 
that we're recommending adding one more subcategory called urban center. And this would apply to downtown St. Petersburg and Clearwater. Um, uh, it's designed for large downtowns that draw people from throughout the region. Um, we're proposing 200 units an acre and 8.0 floor area ratio. That's the same density and just a little higher intensity than transit station center type one, uh, the highest level. And we needed that slight bump in intensity to accommodate St. Pete. Uh, so overall, these changes uh, account for what already exists on the ground uh, in many places in the county. It will allow these centers to continue to, uh, to grow and develop and support future transit. Um, I have mostly talked about our existing activity centers, but uh, there would also be a process, just as there is today, for adopting new activity centers at these levels. Um, they would have to be reviewed at a public hearing by this board and the countywide planning authority. Um, and uh, they would be subject to the locational criteria of the strategy map. Uh, and they would have to meet requirements for transit-oriented design. Uh, all the same requirements that apply today. All of these here, you're saying? All of this in the table? Or what color? Which ones oh. have to come before this committee and the countywide plan? Any new Planning activity authority. center using any of those four subcategories would, would come to you for approval. Um, that, that table is actually just a, a set of locational criteria that we use along with the map. Um, we like to see activity centers go at intersections uh, of those uh, future transit corridors, um, and then we base the appropriate level of activity center on the uh, uh, level of planned transit. So, for example, in the unincorporated area, the, 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 the county planning department has looked at this. <clears throat> Yes, um, for their unincorporated area, yeah. they, would, they would bring the amendment to you <coughs> just like any city would, uh, and it would go through the normal countywide plan map amendment process. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I'm not going to talk as much about uh, multimodal corridor category uh, since it's very similar um, and it isn't used as often. Um, these corridors also have a concentration of jobs and housing, um, but not as much as activity centers. Um, we currently have three subcategories, including the one for grandfathered special area plans. Uh, and we're recommending to keep the other two and then add two more. A supporting corridor would be a new subcategory at 30 units an acre and 2.0 floor area ratio. Uh, secondary uh, corridor, we're recommending 40 units an acre and 2.5 floor area ratio. That's about a, a third higher than it is today. <coughs> For primary corridor, we're proposing 50 units an acre and 3.0 floor area ratio. That's about 25% higher than it is today. And then lastly, premium transit corridor would be another new subcategory, and that would be uh, 60 units an acre and 4.0 floor area ratio. And these are areas on corridors be potentially between activity centers. Right, precisely. Uh, activity centers are within walking distance of transit hubs. And then multimodal corridors are the, the uh, connect the, the transit hubs and they feed uh, like local bus traffic and, and bicycle traffic. Okay. Um, and the, the adoption of a new multimodal corridor would be the same as uh, for an activity center, except instead of putting them at intersections, it would go just along a corridor. Um, currently, these categories are required to meet what we call planning and urban design principles. Um, and these wouldn't change, um, but these help to create a safe and comfortable environment for pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit users. Um, but we're recommending adding a couple of new requirements. Um, uh, first of all, we, we're proposing to add some size ranges for activity centers. Um, we've never had any limits before, and our current activity centers range in size from less than four acres to more than 1,600. Um, very small centers tend to be difficult to serve with transit, and very large ones are, are difficult to make walkable or to function as a center. So we're recommending that uh, minimum and maximum sizes be added, um, but there will be flexibility. If a jurisdiction uh, is small and just geographically unable to meet the minimum size, then that requirement would be waived. And um, larger activity centers would be okay if they're organized into sub-areas, uh, with more than one planned uh, transit hub. Um, we're also recommending adding some use provisions. Uh, currently, we don't have any limitations on what uses can go into an activity center or multimodal corridor. 
Um, we're, we propose creating a disincentive for uh, automobile-oriented uses like self-storage, car washes, um, drive-throughs, and so forth. Um, Auto-oriented uses make it more difficult for pedestrians, uh, bicyclists, and transit users to navigate comfortably. So we're proposing requiring a Tier 3 amendment uh, to allow these uses. Um, now, as we went around and met with local government staff, um, we heard feedback that these changes make a lot of sense for transit-oriented areas. Um, but they wanted to keep some flexibility for uh, areas that just want to be a little more dense and more walkable, but don't rise to the level of a transit station area. Um, so based on that input, we are requiring the creation of a new, uh, cat recommending the creation of a new category called uh, Planned Redevelopment District. Um, it wouldn't be tied to the land use strategy map. Uh, or be as restrictive with size or uses. Um, it would still require the planning and urban design principles, and it would allow a density of 45 units an acre or 2.0 floor area ratio. And that could be used for transitional areas surrounding activity centers, or it could be used by itself. Um, there are just a couple more quick items that uh, I wanted to cover. Um, we're recommending adding provisions for two new local bonuses. Um, these could be used throughout the county. Uh, the first is a density bonus for missing middle housing. Um, these are small multifamily buildings that can fit in with the scale of a single family neighborhood, like that 40 units an acre example I showed earlier. Um, and we did a, a major study on this about a year and a half ago. Um, this bonus would be similar to the affordable housing bonus that we have currently. Um, and uh, again, we've heard a lot of support for this. Um, the second bonus would be for vertical mixed use. Um, this could be used with regular categories like retail and services. Um, normally, if you have a mixed use and say it's half residential and half commercial, um, then you can only use half of the density and half the intensity entitlement on that parcel. Um, this bonus would allow you to use the full amount of both as an incentive for mixed use. Uh, and the very last item is a proposed framework for prioritizing transportation funding. No, no based on local government land use planning. Um, if a community adopts an activity center or multimodal corridor, plans for complete streets, and takes a number of other specific steps, um, then they would receive priority for funding uh, <coughs> complementary projects uh, in the MPO five-year work program. Um, this would be uh, administered through uh, our MPO capacity, but uh, we recommend adopting the policy basis into the countywide plan. So uh, those were all the things we wanted to cover for you uh, today. Um, and if the board agrees on this direction, then staff recommends for you to authorize a public hearing for July. Um, we can provide any additional information you need or answer any questions you have. Um, and the purpose of the public hearing would be to consider a resolution uh, to transmit the amendment to the countywide planning authority. So it's coming back. <clears throat> yeah. It will. Yes. Okay. Because there's, there's a lot here. <laughs> there is a lot. And uh, we're at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I don't expect a lot of uh, in-depth discussion today, but really all we're trying to do here is authorize the public hearing to consider this. Right. And we'll have another bite of the apple, so to speak. As, as, okay. And board members, I really, I, I apologize for the length of the meeting, but this is important stuff. If you want to link land use and transportation, we are adopting a long-range plan in November, and we've got to have this policy framework for that transportation plan to work. And, and I will have a lot of comments at that point in time, but I just want to thank you because I know the city of St. Pete is lo also looking at strategic density increases, and obviously the numbers here proposed are higher than what we have now, but this indicates the direction that we want to go in as well. Yeah, and we are not by any stretch mandating any of this stuff. It is really totally up to local governments to either avail themselves of this or not. But we are providing, you know, some financial incentives on the transportation side for those that want to do so. Uh, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to point something out that we kind of learned in our city. And I, I think I've already had this conversation with Wit, not in regards to this, but I, I do think it relates to this. Um, I know we are a built-out community and I know we only have the option of basically going up. Um, I also know that 
the theory behind um, ridership and transit is, is the higher density. But I also think there's something we're missing, and, and I don't know where it fits in here. Um, I think you all will have to talk about it. But just in our little city, we did a citizen's survey and you know, the three big things everybody was talking about was um, overdevelopment, traffic, and the lack of affordable housing. All three of those things kind of blend together. Um, and we started doing our own little research and found that, you know, in like the last 10 years in our city, we I think we were 35, 38,000 permanent residents. In the last 10 years, we've only increased our residency by 1,700 people, even though we were a city with the most, the highest new construction and um, percent increase in the county. What's killing us is the tourism. Now, we love it. I'm, I'm, please don't get me wrong. We love it. Killing. But the, the amount of increase in tourism, and if you would just look at the last five years of tourism dollars we've gotten, it, it's like a 70-some percent increase. Um, so having said that, I think uh, right now what we're looking at is we're trying to reduce the congestion on our road today by adding this density to a built-out county, and I'm not saying don't do it. I just think we have to accommodate for it. By adding this density to a built-down out county, um, what do we do about those added people? that are living here and how do we accommodate that because the tra we need transit today to accommodate what we have today and then you add all this density so I, again I'm not saying don't add, add the density I'm just saying let's understand the effect of the density we're adding to the transportation that we're going to need that's what I'm saying it took me a little bit to get there. I'm, I apologize. No, I think you raised really good points, Mayor, and we're very sensitive to that. Um, what we're really trying to do, though, is create an environment where non-auto travel makes practical sense. And if you don't have compact, walkable, dense places, it doesn't happen. Um, but, you know, every city is different. And I know you're looking at reducing density or lowering density in, in some cases in, in in Dunedin, or at least not increasing. And that's perfectly fine. Safety Harbor's having the same debate. and um, But we have to at least identify where those places make sense to accommodate that future growth, that they have the ability to do this and tie it to a transportation investment we feel like can make sense. If we stay peanut butter spread suburban across Pinellas County the way we are, yeah. everybody's driving everywhere. Yeah. And they're going to keep driving more and more. And, and VMT keeps going up. And that's not what I'm looking for. And I'm, I'm not even equating to the fact that, you know, I, I know that downtown Dunedin is very different than some areas of Clearwater and St. Petersburg right. and, and other areas, Pinellas Park and Largo. So I'm not trying to compare our little quaint shtick that we've got going on with the, with everything else. I'm, I'm just saying, though, that we have to understand that by adding density, we're also adding people. I'm not saying don't add people. I'm just saying we have to plan our transportation yeah. Bingo. Toronto above. Yeah. Yeah. We need it now, and we don't have it. Let's not build to – let's – I'm just saying you're, yeah. you're still adding more people. And well, the numbers that we have right now that we hear about are a million people in the county and then another million – five on top of that on our roads with tourism. Right. So, and, um, and so right now. So we, we know that right. our, our, our wonderful tourists who come to visit um, create challenges, but that's okay. Uh, we're trying to <coughs> figure out how to deal with that. But, uh, um, and I, and I, I don't think the adding one more Largo, that's what we keep talking about, 90 to 100,000, yeah. maybe. 90, 92,000. Yeah, 92,000 people in, the, in that 2045 time frame, right? That's what we're kind of planning for, is going to be overly excessive compared to the amount of, as you say, the tourists that we have now. Right. So I don't know that, I mean, we'll continue I, to grow in tourism and we'll continue to grow a little bit in overall a regular yeah. population, but yeah. And I will add that it, this is not intended to increase population as much as shift the locations of the population that are, is already coming. Um, new people continue to move into the county each year and we see lots of small land use changes, yeah. um, 10, 15 unit yeah. 
uh, from 10 to 15 units an acre here and there around the county. We'd rather see those people go into an activity center where we can serve them with transit. And we certainly are seeing that downtown St. Petersburg, downtown Dunedin, mm -hmm. et cetera. So, Mayor Bradbury. Thank you. Um, kind of bringing back what Rodney just discussed a minute ago, mm -hmm. where does the resilience go into this package that we just got? Um, you know, it, as far as Julie brought up a wonderful thing, we get questions asked by our citizens every day about our roads and they're up to here and yet we're going to tell them that we're going to pile on double the amount of citizens that are going to be living and driving or getting some kind of alternative transportation right on top of let's, that. Let's clarify, we're not doubling the population. It's 90,000 people, that's projected. That's gonna, that's, we can't stop that. No, we, we can't. can guide where it happens. We, we have to be strate strategic about it and at the same time, we need to make sure that we're not chasing our tail as we have been for the last 50 years with the roads, that's right. with our transportation, because that's what we do. We design it now, but we're not building it for another 10 years. And by the time that we go to build it, the design we have is obsolete because it's, yeah. you know, either gotten more intense or the buildings that were there are now empty and they've moved someplace else, you know, so we, with the resilience, with the drainage, with the more intense that we're asking it to be, then where do we have those kids play? You know, if, if we've got concrete from one end of the county to the other, where do we expect those kids to play? Well, I would argue, that, know, we, I would argue that we have a lot of parks in, we, our, in we, our county. We do so. have a lot, but I'm are not saying we excessive, those I'm just intense saying. areas near the parks? Yeah. Are you. we building them near the roads? I think we're just trying to consolidate opportunities in, in certain areas that make sense. Right. Um, and the urban design um, guidelines that, that Linda referenced require open space, require other kinds of amenities like that to address that. So that's, that, and, and a lot of these, all, all of these are, you know, you have a comprehensive plan in your local government. So you've got standards for how much parks and recreation you provide for your population. So ultimately this is a local calculation. We don't want to be in the way. And that's, that's what we want to, that's the space we want to play. We want to enable the right kind of growth in the right locations. We don't want to be in the way and be an impediment to cities that want to create that kind of place or, or unincorporated county. And the only thing, you know, I think some of the cautionary comments, uh, we just that the, those corridors between these activity centers, um, making sure that we, I, I just want to make sure we've carefully identified which ones those are because there's some other corridors that are scenic in, in nature or that have densities around them that are one house per two, two acres, for instance, mm -hmm. we don't want to be putting things like this That's right. in play that at, go at those issues, you know, those, those kind of things that we've done. So. And the corridors that have been identified on the land use strategy map um, were uh, chosen through an MPO screening process that looked at uh, existing population densities right. and yeah. employment densities yeah. and, and also uh, low income. Yeah. So uh, I think that, that should cover yeah. that for sure. Uh, Mayor. I just, Linda, I wanted to thank you for the mixed use piece that you put in this because we are a county of small business individuals and if we can create an avenue so that they can live and work and play in our, as they're coming this 90,000, I think that that works. So I want to, I just, I'm a mixed use person and I'm glad that you put that in there. And whether you're in Largo or Dunedin or St. Pete and Clearwater, I think that that is an avenue that we need to broaden in the future. So I appreciate that you added that in your presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Welch. I, I just wanted to commend staff and the partners on this. I thought it was a great presentation. It was a weighty day today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's not but, over. Um, very well done. We're going to hear it three more times, Mr. Chairman, um, at least. Uh, but I just wanted to thank you. I, and I could hear you in the back. We have speakers in the back. Uh, and I just want to say this is a great effort, a lot of good uh, improvements in here. Agreed. We, we need, need a motion. To the end. We need a motion. We need a motion. Yeah. Second. Okay, a motion. 
Council Member Rice, second Mayor Kennedy. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. We're just flying right along. We are here. flying right along. I'm this, sorry. And I always think when we're going past <laughs> two or three o'clock, you know, now four o'clock, I think mean, this is uh, our, our buddy uh, John Maroney oh, would be no. very upset with me right now. But uh, I did, I did <laughs> warn you all. <laughs> yeah. but last meeting. I did hear Yeah, the you warning. warned us last meeting. You didn't warn us this one. <laughs> all right. No, no problem. Let's move on to the 34th straight, uh, Street Lane Repurposing Project. And uh, Al Bartolotta is going to come up, and Al has promised me that he will keep this very short. Yes. Mm. We Thank need you. to have a, you know how we do the timers for <laughs> the citizens? Oh. I think we need a timer for the presentations, too. <laughs> well, thank you all for still being here. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our 34th Street uh, repurposing lane repurposing project. This is an effort we've been working on very closely with the City of St. Petersburg, DOT, as well as the uh, residents down at the Skyway Marina District. So we have uh, DOT is scheduled to resurface uh, 34th Street from 22nd Ave North to 54th Ave South in 2022. This presented an opportunity for us to take a look at that section that runs through the Skyway District. Um, down to 54th Ave South to look at um, a lane repurposing project. And really what this calls for is taking that outside lane. Right now it's six lanes. We'd be taking that outside lane, repurposing it for uh, transit use as well as for right turn, what's called business access or bat lanes, as well as uh, also um, uh, in, in installing some uh, pedestrian crosswalks at mid-block locations and uh, also putting in uh, wide sidewalks on both sides of the road. And so this is not only intended to um, address pedestrian safety and try to improve accessibility down there, but also is really trying to help the city and the Skyway Marina District realize this vision for the corridor down there, which is really what they want to try to do is make this a destination district for South St. Petersburg instead of a place where people just drive through at high speeds on their way to somewhere else. So this is a two-mile section of road, 45-mile-an-hour um, speed limit, although everybody knows they go a whole lot faster than that down there. It's very much like a raceway. Um, not only is this part of the Skyway Marina District, it's also part of the South St. Petersburg's uh, CRA. It's about seven and a half square miles, our largest CRA down there. Also, it's a pretty busy bus route. This is part of Route 34. It carries about a million and a half riders per year. Also, it's fairly frequent headways, 20 to 30 minutes. So you've got a pretty decent uh, transit service already existing down there. I want to talk a little bit about some of the traffic there. Um, one of the patterns that you see is traffic starts to drop off when you get down to 22nd Ave South. And you can see here by the numbers, it's 36,500 and gets down about 28,000. When you get south to 22nd Ave South, it drops down a little bit more. So what, what you're seeing is a lot of people are turning there at 22nd. So definitely seeing a drop off of traffic at that point. Uh, traffic by year, uh, the chart you see there goes from 2010 to 2017. Uh, the traffic generally stays within 27, 28, 26,000. I could take this back to 2000. You'd be very, seeing a very similar trend line there. Um, the road itself, if you've been on it, and one reason why we have really uh, very fast uh, speeds out there, travel speeds, is because uh, the road's only about 50% capacity. You've got very wide lanes, which really encourages people to travel fast. Um, we've got a pretty good parallel road system, 31st and 37th Street. Both operate pretty well. They're also well under capacity. And, of course, you know we've got the interstate and we've got uh, improvements scheduled uh, in the fairly near future there, which will help. Uh, we did have a lane elimination feasibility, feasibility analysis that was done by our consultant HDR. They took a look at, uh, with these improvements made, how it would affect traffic conditions. And basically it would not affect travel conditions um, as particularly, particularly at the intersections where um, we would have drop-off lanes, so we really l wouldn't lose any capacity there. Excuse me real quick. You just yeah. talked about lane elimination, and earlier you I'm talked sorry, about... lane repurposing. <laughs> I'm okay. sorry about right. So the <laughs> process step. is called lane elimination? Yeah. And that's the DOT process? So we had to follow that process? Okay. we're not recommending elimination. Okay, either. thank you. Yeah, yep. and, and actually the initial study that was done, it was a lane elimination analysis, but yeah. it, was it was really just looking at what would happen if you re reduce your number of general purpose through lanes. So how that, would that, that, that outer lane um, is going to be used 
in multiple different ways, yeah, including and that's right why turns and all that. So it's not being eliminated. Right. And we're not putting parking in there. We're not doing... Nope. Right. Okay. And that's, that's why it's repurposing, repurposing it for okay. bus and, Thank and you. right turn, basically. Uh, this just gives you a little bit of a snapshot of crashes on the corridor. We do have an average of about 148 per year on that section. Uh, most of the crashes you can see by this graphic are located around the intersections at either end, 22nd Avenue, South, where you had 175 during this period from 2013 to 2017, and 54th Ave South, where you had 130, and that's also where most of the bike ped crashes occurred, eight at 22nd, and you had um, four down at 130th. We've had uh, two fatalities during this time as well. Is that, is that any different than going north of that area, or do you see a, a significantly different description down This is there. pretty consistent, what we see just generally okay. on the six-lane right. roads. It's not really anything unusual. Okay. Uh, crashes by ear, this shows you generally it's not anything. This has pretty much been a constant. We get about 148 per year. Um, crashes, I, I did point out here at the bottom, we do have 18% of crashes involved the younger age group, 15 to 24. That is a little bit higher than usual. I did want to point that out. Uh, the crash trends that we see on that corridor is generally a reflective of, again, just very high-speed travel. Most of the crash, uh, crashes that occur down there are either straight-ahead movements or left turns. And dr drilling down deeper into that, aggressive driving we see is a factor in 30% of the straight-ahead crashes and 70% of the left turn. So, again, these are, this is symptomatic of roads where you just have really high travel speeds. Well, what is the speed limit and what will it be? It's 45 now. It would be reduced to 35 with <clears> lane <throat> repurposing. But, and I should say it's too. It's not only the, um, it's not only a higher speed in the fact that you've got wide lanes, but visually, if you look at that roadway, it's pretty green and all the, in the development there is, it's, it's very suburbanized and you have very large swaths of green in front. So, visually, it just creates a drag strip kind of mentality for a lot of the gotcha. drivers there. I think that's so pretty 45 evident. 45 is not what they probably go. It, no. Even though that's the stated speed limit. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> okay. they go a lot faster than that. Um, so this just shows you an existing cross-section of what you have there. Uh, the lanes generally uh, about 12 feet, uh, 12 to 13 feet travel lanes right now. Uh, sidewalks about um, 5 to 6 feet as well with a landscape median there. The bat lane concept, what it would look like is you'd have about 11-foot travel lanes, 11-foot 11, 11 lanes uh, on the outside for the buses and right turns, and the sidewalks 6 to 10 feet with a, a landscape buffer there. I did want to say the sidewalks, uh, ideally, we are going to try to, to get to that 10 feet, um, but this is just really accounting for the fact we, there is some right-of-way constraints in some of the areas, so, but working with DOT through design, you know, we're, they're going to make every effort to try to get to that 10 feet. Um, this is just showing a cross section where you have a, where, where you would have a pedestrian crossing, showing that you have about a 10-foot uh, pedestrian refuge, <clears throat> refuge. One of the things that's been discussed in a lot of our meetings is uh, trying to use landscaping to um, to help identify those areas where you'd have the mid-block crossings. They just These are just some um, aerials, just showing what it would look like. This is an example of uh, what you'd see at an intersection. Um, you would note there you've got some extension of the median out a little bit into the intersection. And then, of course, you see the signage and the, uh, the red where the bus uh, bat lanes would be. This is an example where you'd have a mid-block mid crossing with the, intersect with the, uh, with the uh, bu bus lanes or the bat lanes. I did want to mention, too, the locations for these uh, mid-block crossings are consistent with the city's uh, complete street implementa implementation plan that was recently approved. And this is just, lastly, just looking at transition areas between the intersections and those mid-blocks. Um, we had a public workshop on April 4th. Um, we had a survey that was done. We had 65 participants in the survey. About 46% of the folks that were there were from the Skyway Marina District. Generally, they were in favor. We had about 54% who were in favor of the bat lanes. 80% uh, 80, 80 were in support of the uh, crosswalks and about 85% supported the need to have uh, better pedestrian and bike facilities there. Did want to mention that the, one, of the, one of the purposes of the, having the wide sidewalk is there. We realized that we want to get the bikes up on that wide uh, sidewalk side path instead of having them on the roadway. Um, and this is, I'm not going to go into details here, you have this in your package, but generally this just points out some of the, uh, the big concerns they have. You see number one, a big issue, motorist behavior, speeding, running red lights, and safe accommodations for the bicyclists and pedestrians. 
And some of the things they would like to see is encouraging more mixed-use development, bus stop amenities, and more pedestrian-friendly <laughs> land use design as well. Um, and that's a big challenge there, as I said, because, you know, we're trying to get, we want to have, see some design there that encourages more walkability. I think that's really got to be necessary going into the future. <clears throat> and just next steps, I just point out, I mentioned before, construction is currently scheduled for 2020, and we anticipate at some point probably working with the city as well as the Skyway Marine District on a more detailed, complete 2022, plan right? Construction. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, 2022. Yeah. And the reason we brought this for you today on this long meeting day is that uh, we need to get this direction to DOT fairly quickly so that they can move into the yeah. design work. So okay. there is a timing issue here. Councilor so looking for your so endorsement. Thank you. Thank you, Al, for the presentation. The Skyway Marina District is a very important uh, area to St. Petersburg, and it's one of our top economic development priorities. And um, we have a very uh, energized and well-informed neighborhood yes. and uh, business district and main streets. And Eckerd College has also been very engaged yeah. in talking about the plans for South um, 34th Street. So, and this also <coughs> links back to our previous discussion about the countywide plan changes because a lot of those folks would like to see us concentrate on moving away from a suburban right. land use pattern and the large campuses, and they want to see us go towards livable, walkable, mixed use. Some of the transit changes, transportation changes, they want, um, I don't know we can do if we can do right now, but this is a really good first step to getting there. But one thing that the city and county with Ford Pinellas mm -hmm. could do to help work with them is to look at making some of those land use changes right. to set forth um, the type of development that they want to welcome. Yeah, and some of the representatives of the Skyway District are actually even meeting with some of the developers to try to encourage them to, you know, to at least like move the parking maybe to the side and kind of make it a little bit more, you know, walkable design. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I know. Uh, that's been a great part of this. I mean, totally changing the whole character of the highway there is, that's a lot of money to really change some, you know, some fixed assets that have a lot of value. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we could look at would be the, the, the roads that cross that and how they can connect the different areas to promote walkability and mixed right. use development. Yeah, your best walkable development may be away from 34th Street on those perpendicular streets. Right, right, rather than to try to turn it into one big fancy complete street. Right. Yeah. So DOT has been a great partner. They've been working with us on the wide yeah, sidewalk definitely. and the resurfacing. And so we just kind of need to provide that direction so that they can go and design and bring back. You'll see the design coming back. So this is not, again, the last time you'll see it. <coughs> Mr. Welch. Um, thank you. And this is, uh, I agree with uh, Councilmember Rice. Very important project, again, mm -hmm. at the end of a, of a um, long and detailed meeting. But um, I live down in this neighborhood as well, and um, I can't think of really a better place um, because 275 is literally, literally a stone's throw away from it uh, to implement this kind of project. The only thing I would add um, is the messaging <laughs> has got to be accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, my neighborhood association got sideways on this early, Lakewood Estates, because they thought it was elimination, and, and it's not. And so as long as we can keep that messaging, you know, on point, right. I think the project has got a lot of good uh, benefits. One of the things I'm uh, a little bit concerned about driving that every day, I've been riding my bike down there. I do ride my bike. Carefully. Really? I we didn't know that. I absolutely <laughs> um, Is the mid-block crossing. That, that's going to have the yellow LEDs. Yes. And it's just getting across six lanes, um, Red I'm LED. concerned. Because on 22nd Avenue South, which is four lanes, I'm still a little cautious by using that one by Thurgood Marshall. Right. Because just because of the speed of the cars, and they don't always recognize it. So have we you know, kind of projected how that's going to work with six lanes? Well, I think it's going to it's going to be a lot of things that are going to go in to try to get again to change the the mindset of the motorists to go slower. I think one obviously is the lowering the speed limits, but um, if you can install uh, these these mid block crossings frequently enough, you know it does work to help kind of slow the motors down. But I, the island in the middle. yeah, do something in the middle in the median to help again create more of a visual you know thought process where hey, this is an area where there are pedestrians and yeah, 
There'll be a combination of things, and that's something as well. As we, when we get into the design, we'll look at to see what other things we might be able yeah, to do. Doing to help something in the middle, I think, is yeah. really. I mean, I know in some areas we've put actual bar protectors out there so that you, in case a car decides to do something goofy, yeah. that you literally have physical protection out there so that people feel better about it, but it also truly does make a difference. Yeah. We have a situation. Mayor. Um. With that discussion, are they not going to have the overhead flashing lights? Well, these would be the for three lanes. This car flight. stops. This car stops. The one in the middle doesn't necessarily, because they can't see the flashing lights. If especially if it's a bus blocking the stopping on this side, or a service truck or something of that nature, on the right hand side, that person in the middle is not going to see that flashing light. That right. is something we can look at in design. They yeah, would think maybe their the buses stop to let somebody off. Not necessarily stop to let somebody go across. Right, right. We'll we'll yeah, we'll, we'll talk to DOT about what they can do with that. That that's actually a good observation. I think it's yeah. a great a great point that we've noticed that you know everywhere we're starting to put and they're becoming more prevalent throughout yes. the county. When they first started, you know, we would say, oh, this is great, but then you start to see how it works on two lane roads or four lane roads, and now we're talking six lane roads. So there's, you know, we just have to be very yeah. careful. Mm -hmm. um, that Understood. More more. You know, yes, is important. So yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Need a motion. We need a motion uh, on this. Um, Move approval. Second. Okay. Okay. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the next up is the um, is Wits uh, performance evaluation, and um, we should end this on a short meeting. <laughs> 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 now this could go on for two hours now, so I'm kidding. <laughs> um, um, all right, um, we we the, ex the executive team uh, met to discuss the, the the results. You see them in the in the in the backup, um, and so I'm just going to touch on a few things, uh, kind of uh, uh, what we're recommending, and then just review a couple points, and then. Uh, open up for any conversation or any observations or um, essentially uh, we, uh, we we thought that uh, wit continues to do a really really good job and I think um, the 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 overall scores from all the members sort of reflect that um, I will say that the uh, there's a page that gets into each of the categories of uh, one partnerships external communication leadership effectiveness fiscal management internal communications and reporting uh, so we've looked now three years in a row, and um, I think in this current year from last year, in all areas, uh, it, with the exception of par partnerships, which is already high uh, rating, all areas, the average scores went up um, in all of those areas. And each of the, there's probably about 37 questions that were looked at and considered by all of you in each of these, um, in all of uh, one, two, three, uh, five categories. Um, so I think significantly, um, there was improvement even above the high level that he attained last year. Um, and uh, so overall, um, it was recommended that he continue uh, receiving or get that 3% uh, salary adjustment uh, as everybody else in the uh, uh, Pinellas County Unified Personnel System would get. Um, we're going to have, uh, we're also recommending one other travel adjustment um, outside of District 7, um, uh, WIT, as all of us submit. Uh, you know, your mileage uh, for reimbursement. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here. That will continue. This is with traveling within District 7. Um, uh, when the when Witt was first hired, there was a $125 a month put into his salary. Though, though there is no real record of that, that's that's what is there. We're going to make that officially in, his re in the record now. Um, but as you move around District 7 and the amount of time, and, and you can see in the ratings, his, his work with partners is always good because he's, he's doing a lot of that traveling around. The 125 is not enough. So we're recommending bumping that to 250 a month um, or a one-time increase of, not one-time increase, that'll always be there, $1,500 additional uh, per year in his salary to cover the necessary travel reimbursement within District 7. If I, did I say that right? It's a one-time, not every year, so it'd be a one-time increase. We're not doing the, another increase next year, but we're doing the one-time increase that will stay. At 250. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I didn't mean that we're going to do that every year, but, but we're going to keep it at that level. Right. 
uh, that's that would be the idea. Is that did I get that right? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. And um, so um, again, uh, generally speaking, I think uh, there was a lot of uh, the, the high high ranking is a four on all of the questions and. Um, I'd say that the uh, the average uh, was uh, 3.7, uh, which was up from 3.5, the overall score. And within each of those categories that I just mentioned, there was increase as well. Uh, so overall, we were extremely happy as an executive team with his performance. Uh, um, there was a couple of comments uh, that were added as far as continuing to work. And I know Rodney's been a big help uh, in terms of continuing to work with staff. Um, because that was been one of the concerns that we had last year, that we make sure that, w that, that WIT's available and accessible f uh, with staff, but at the same time having a little reorganization to, to provide upper management accessibility for, uh, for folks is really important, and I think that continues to go well, uh, but we always continue to try to do, uh, to have be more accessible. And I think you're doing some things to that effect to try to make yourself more accessible. So overall, uh, that was kind of our review and uh, kind of how we're looking at moving forward. So before we make any motion and second on that, I just uh, open it up to any comments or questions that we might have. Um, or Yes, uh, Mayor. I um, was very happy. I've only been on the board this time around for a short period of time. I was very happy with um, Witt's performance, even though if you look at my score, it looks so much lower than everybody else. That is no reflection on him. I just hadn't only been here a couple months, so when I did his review, um, I was a part of the group that hired him, so I'm obviously happy with him. I, I knew what we were getting. Yeah. Um, the only thing I would uh, add is I, I looked at the the last page of the eval evaluation where it talks about the you know goals and expectations and I agree with all of them I love the idea of uh, getting us on Granicus Dave <clears throat> because I will tell you that the going back and forth I like being green and not having the printed thing but the going back and forth between the agenda and and the the actual staffing 150 pages later not an easy thing mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so getting on Granicus would be, I We're think, the smart way to do it. Um, you know, looking at the, another person mentioned that we're org chart, you know, taking a look at that and making sure there's a strong second. The things that I put down were, were I think, are we're already working on, so I don't think I have to repeat them. So very happy with your performance, and you certainly worked hard to help Dunedin, and I appreciate that. Commissioner Sofa. Uh, I did look into the uh, travel expenses, and the $125 per month was below the standards of his requirements of what he has to do within the scope of his job. So I do think it's adequate to go to $250 a month to justify. I believe that's justified in going forward, sure. personally. And it's certainly not that he has to use it, but it's just if he does use it, there's no reason to lose ground. On that on that basis, so thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Uh, yes, ma'am. I just want to clarify for the record that part of this motion is to include that you're actually an official contract. There is an amendment. Right. Right. And we can that that that's part of. Okay. Well, thank you for that uh, additional clarification. Yeah, and that 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 amendment to the to the contract is effective July one. Whereas the raise is effective with like everybody else's in October. October. October so, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Does everybody got that? Okay. Um, any other comments? Uh, then I need a motion for that uh, uh, executive team's recommendation. Move oh. to approve as recommended by the executive team with the amendment for July 1. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Good job. Thank you. Keep up, keep up the good work. And uh, now I have the thirty-minute presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, You're I'll not going to have right, a quorum. I'll tell you right now, we're going to be bringing this into a quick uh, end here. Quick end. Ahead. Quick landing. Uh, TMA met on Friday. Uh, no drama after all. <laughs> And uh, we actually had a really good presentation on earmarks uh, from Carl McKiska of the MPOAC. Please, 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 I'm going to reiterate, do not go to your legislative delegation and ask for transportation funding outside of the MPO process uh, because there are some bad ramifications that can happen. Uh, even if the project gets funded, we've got to find the money out of another District 7 project, probably in our county. 
So, but more um, importantly, if it doesn't get funded, and then it gets vetoed by the by the governor. Then DOT can't touch it for at least a year. So, if you have any questions about that, I will be happy to share Carl McKiska's presentation. And Councilmember Rice, I'm sorry you were you missed the meeting, but we had the presentation on the funding sources and limitations on funding sources that DOT provided. Mm -hmm. Stephen Benson and Ming Gao did a great job walking Good. through that. I will make sure you all have a copy of that presentation and I'll walk you through some of those issues okay. that you may have a question about. Uh, but I thought that was really productive and very helpful and so um, we'll meet again on September 6th as a TMA. Okay. And the last little thing just to mention is that um, we do have meetings coming up. Uh, there is a <clears throat> Joint Tourist Development Council Board of County Commissioners meeting on June 20th to talk about transportation. Uh, and then, um, and I'm not sure I have much of a role there, but I will be there. And then there is a um, Board of County Commissioners workshop on July 18th on transportation. And I've been very working very closely with county staff and PSTA to put together that presentation around the, the big themes of moving traffic, enhanced transit, and safety. All the things that we've been talking about here at this meeting. And I believe we've got the really a great basis for a strong partnership. That's also tackling the affordable housing issue. What Linda didn't really mention is all these corridors that we're talking about in our countywide plan are going to be the foundation for how we target our affordable housing strategies too. So there's a lot going on. It's an economic and housing strategy and transportation is the means of getting us there. So um, stay tuned for that and with that I'm done. You're, you're finished. Well, that was very quick and I, I just I wanted to I made a comment at the end of our TMA that it was nice that we didn't have a the same level of tension that we normally have in those meetings that we really had some good productive conversation uh, when we asked once or twice of the members that were there that uh, that whether or not Hillsborough was going to adopt our priorities what she needs you yes To move that to the next meeting. Okay. Uh, there's a memo in your packet on the multimodal impact fee ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically, we wrote a memo saying we need to be out of it, um, and that the count it's a county ordinance, and uh, it's a legacy of our um, structure back in the day when we were a division of the county planning department, and uh, that's outlined in the memo. Um, so we'll be facilitating that transition. Yeah, uh, and, and and I just I really want everybody to make sure that you get all the way to the end uh, in that uh, section nine. I think there's some really good stuff in there uh, relating to uh, trail use. I think the fatalities map is always good to get in perspective what drives a lot of our talk and discussions and and thinking. Um, there's also some uh, a real reflection on our staff and wit uh, with over 50 outreach and stakeholder meetings in the last month. Um, I think we're out there doing things, uh, getting in, in touch with in, in front of a lot of people. So um, and uh, so I think that's uh, that's that's amazing. And then uh, FDOT continues to provide us with their district fatality uh, maps. Again, I just think it's something we, we, we talk about that being a really critical component of certainly uh, st uh, Main Streets and all, uh, you know, um, complete, streets. complete Streets. Thank you, Main Streets is from a different era. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you again for another 430 meeting. I just can't thank you enough for your patience getting through it. It's it's all important stuff, but uh, we'll, we'll work on it to make uh, our former our former commissioner Maroney a little happier um, but thank you again I mean that uh, and we uh, we are adjourned